Okay. Uh, we'll now uh, convene the meeting of the Board of Supervisors for July 1, 214. Hard to believe it's July. And uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we'll begin the meeting with uh, public comment. Uh, this is an uh, opportunity for... Oh, Okay, reset. <laughs> Roll call, please. Supervisor Groom. Present. Supervisor Horsley. Here. Supervisor Slocum. Here. Supervisor Tissier. Here. President Pine. Here. Okay. So this is the opportunity for public comment for individuals to speak on items that are uh, uh, not on the agenda, are listed on the consent agenda, uh, or pertaining to the county's manager's report uh, or board member requests. So uh, we can take uh, comments up to two minutes, and uh, we have uh, four, uh, four slips today. So Ms. Mr. Marty Fox. Good morning, President Pine, members of the board. My fellow veteran, Mr. Slocum. Deputy County Manager, Ms. Ferales, and County Council, Mr. Byers. Thank you for your service to the county, including your service to those residents living with serious mental illness who are insight deficient and cannot advocate for the services that would restore their freedom to associate with their families on this Independence Day. Because they are living on the streets, hospitalized, incarcerated, or dead, like Yanira Serrano, Errol Chang, and Edgar Aristondo. Please vote to implement Laura's Law. The United States Department of Justice approved assisted outpatient treatment Laura's Law as an effective, efficient, and humane hospitalization and incarceration recidivism reduction program in March of 2012. And that is a fact that the health system's intellectually and morally corrupt policies and procedures ignores in its cult-like worship of the bloodthirsty Lanham and Petrus Short Act and HIPAA gods. Continuing to throw money down mental health wellness rat holes which rely on the brutality of the streets to modify the behavior of persons living with serious mental illness who are insight deficient and that promote recidivism is irresponsible and inhumane and immoral as well as deadly for mentally ill persons like 34-year-old Errol Chang, 18-year-old Yanira Serrano who was killed on June 3rd. How many more families of persons living with serious mental illness have to suffer after their adult children die on the streets that the health system uses to modify their behavior with before the recovery racketeers are held responsible. The Rules Committee of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted to recommend the implementation of Laura's Law last week. You have an opportunity to show what public service means to those who need help and their families. Please vote to implement Laura's Law now. Our next speaker will be Roger Medler. Yes, good morning. Anyway, I come up here to talk to the actually the public instead of the Board of Supervisors. I'm not seeming to get any response from the Board of Supervisors with my violations in Pacifica. Uh, and also, I'd like to uh, bring up the subject of Mr. Richard Johnson and a fire lane behind my house. Uh, I was supposed to be within 150 feet of the facilities, and uh, I seem to be an argument with him, but he, I'm not getting any response from him either. Anyway, he said he's going to push the cars out of that are in in, in park there, used as a parking lot now, out of the way with the fire truck. And that's a little ridiculous as far as I can see. And I'd like to congratulate the Rules Committee of San Francisco Board of Supervisors on their progress with the mentally ill. And uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Therese Dyer. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, Teresa Dyer, 14 away, Crespi Drive. Uh, just trying to get a little justice from somewhere, you know. I'm going to read you an article that was written in the Pacifica Tribune, so I'm not an isolated case. I've been reading your column from Teresa Dyer and Paul Schmidt, and I'm right, 
writing to let you know these things do happen. I know of one case where papers have been expunged from this party's file and the real estate had illegal activity according to the 1099. I have heard of court clerks switching paperwork. In mine, my exhibits were lost during trial and now in my file. I received a lot of misinformation from consultations from several attorneys and resource agencies did not have the capacity to help me. My case has a lot of flaws in it to get the ruling I received. In some areas, criminal acts were done. I would like to hear more about Teresa's case and Paul Schmidt to see what has transpired from these illegal activities and how to stop them. I have been to several support group meetings and finding out that these aren't isolated incidents and occurring far too often. I hope that your paper will continue to run any letters regarding these issues so more people will realize that they are not left alone and uncommonly tossed aside by the county stating that these people did not get what they want. The county has several flaws and I have seen too many attorneys taking advantage of the system. Christina Maldano, South San Francisco. Okay, and I believe our final speaker is Ron uh, Maykel. Uh, good morning, uh, honorable supervisors and staff. Uh, my name is Ron Maykel, Pacifica, long-term resident in Pacifica. Yeah, uh, I'm here uh, speaking on this issue about San Mateo Creek, a beautiful creek, historically been there for pre-Columbian days for sure. Uh, and, and as you know, the water department continually keeps a certain uh, water release from the dam so that that creek has water in it uh, you know, annually, a sufficient amount of water. And as you may or may not know, it has steelhead and it has native crayfish and of course endangered frogs and probably the western pond turtle and other things and many insects and land animals that uh, depend on that creek. But it, it is not being protected. Okay, it gets, you know, huge assaults of, uh, of trash during the wintertime, you know, urban trash and also uh, automobile byproducts. I've walked that creek and happened to see it a few times in the wintertime, styrofoam, plastic bottles, you know, the same old stuff. That is really a, a, an amazing creek, and U.S. San Mateo County supervisors really need to put together a task force to see how we can maybe, one thing we're doing in Pacific is, is we have started and, and, and would like to ex expand it is put grills on the street storm drains, you know, the, the, where all that water, a lot of that stuff, uh, trash comes from there. That's where most, 90% of it comes from. So I would really appreciate it if you guys are really, uh, recognize the beauty and the, and the value of that creek and, and maybe put together a task force to look at how you can prevent that from happening. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any other public speakers? So seeing none, we can move to um, set the agenda. Um, one item which I've spoke to the sheriff about, which I'd like to move off consent, is uh, number number 33, uh, concerning the transfer of inmates to Alameda County. So the, what the sh sheriff will come and speak to that concurrent with his report later in the agenda. So uh, uh, any other recommend, any other things to pull off the consent? Move approval of the uh, consent agenda with that item removed as well as the uh, regular agenda. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. We'll move to pre presentations and awards. And uh, Supervisor Horsley, uh, turn over to you for the San Mateo County Resource uh -huh. Conservation District. Thank you, President Pine. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kellex uh, Nelson. And yeah, she's uh, com uh, coming up. Uh, the Resource Conservation District, uh, you know, provides lots of resources for private landowners as well as uh, government agencies on the coast side, and they do this uh, with a remarkably, uh, um, I guess, efficient and uh, well-informed uh, staff. And I have to tell you, last night I went to a meeting in Pescadero. You know, we have this long-term project with. Uh, flooding and the health of the marsh and uh, we had some just a preliminary report last night about it was a two-hour presentation and I have to tell you that 
it was really a remarkable presentation that uh, Kellex and the consultants made. Uh, this is a really difficult and intract intractable problem that's been going on for many decades, and um, I think she, she was able to explain why it's occurred. And um, while we don't have the completed uh, project yet, that'll be completed sometime later this year, uh, there are at least some hope for some resolution and some potential, do some ex more exploration of some of the potential uh, solutions to it. But I have to really hand it to Kellex. Uh, you did really a remarkable job last night. Um, you know, it can be a very, you know, it's a very difficult thing when you, you know, you, this community there has suffered from constant flooding for decades and uh, they, you know, they're very upset. But uh, uh, I, I think that, um, they felt that there was some real progress being made. So congratulations on that. And with that, describe the Resource Conservation District. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors and other folks who are here today. It's nice to see you. I'm very pleased to be um, giving my nearly annual presentation to talk about one of my favorite topics in the world, which is your Resource Conservation District. I'm very proud of it. I'm proud of the work we do. Um, and I also wanted to know, I think that we have a director, uh, one of our directors in the audience today with whom I think you are familiar, which is Dave Holland. He is on our board. Um, he's not with you, but he's with us now. So um, I just wanted to ask where I point this when I forward. Oh, just Any anywhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK. So um, a little bit about the Resource Conservation District, or RCD. Um, we have been around since 1939. We were formed by landowners in San Mateo County, primarily farmers, largely as a response to the Dust Bowl crisis when they realized that soil was a federal resource and the federal government created the Soil Conservation Service. Our names have changed, but we're still in partnership. Um, RCDs, there are about 100 of them across the state of California and in San Mateo County, forward-thinking farmers created the first in the state and we're celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. We largely serve the western half of the county, although we're unable to do work also um, in other parts of the county as well, and you'll see some of those projects shortly. What we do is we provide technical assistance. We do projects. Some of you on this board have seen some of our projects out in the field with me. We do undertake a great deal of conservation planning, and we do a lot of education and outreach. All of this towards the goal of water supply, clean water at our beaches and in our creeks, healthy forests, grasslands, habitat, energy efficiency, um, resilience to climate change, wildfires, the, it, it really the whole package of comprehensive resource management. Although a big focus right now is water, water, water. You know, they say water is the new oil. Um, we're really um, in the crosshairs of some of the issues regarding water. Everything that we do, literally everything, is through partnership. We are not a, a landowner. Um, we are not an advocacy group. We're not an entity that litigates. Uh, we work with people to help manage resources, and we do everything through partnership. The kinds of expertise that we have are geologists, biologists, hydrologists, engineers, soil scientists. Basically, I always say anybody who's got an IST is, works with, with us or on our staff. And the way that we do environmental work is somewhat unique in that we help people help the land. That is our job. Something else that's somewhat unique to RCDs is that our work is, even though we are an, an entity of government, we're a subdivision of the state for contracting purposes through Division 9 of the Public Resource Code. Our work is non-regulatory. We can provide people with confidential technical assistance on their property, and it's free. This is why we are invited onto properties where I can say with some confidence that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or the State Water Board would not be invited. And this is important because it means that sometimes where there's the most opportunity to make environmental improvements, we're invited. And we have a pretty good sense of what's going on. Uh, an inherent component of how we do our work, it's hard to see, I think, on the um, on this screen, is that all of our work is looking for win-win solutions. Supervisor Horsley talked about our efforts to resolve the flooding for the community of Pescadero in partnership with the county and others. This is an example of a project that's a win-win. When you drive down the coast and you see that gorgeous landscape, I think many people don't realize quite how intentional some of these features are. So, for example, when you see a pond, 
it is probably intentional. It was put there by somebody. It wasn't natural. This is an example of a project where we are, um, where we are doing work to establish a pond that will be for agricultural viability on this ranch and also for the recovery of endangered California red-legged frogs and San Francisco mm -hmm. garter snake. It serves mutual benefit. It has an economic benefit for the landowner. It helps with agricultural viability and local food source. Also, by getting water to certain parts of the ranch, it helps us with being able to to have water that helps the kinds of plants grow that will sequester carbon and take it out of the atmosphere for climate resilience. A lot of our work is in agriculture, and not just with agriculture, but anywhere we work, we only work where we are invited. With that invitation, we're able to accomplish a great deal. We can do projects that are voluntary, have multiple benefits. We can help with water stewardship, build soil health, do wildlife-friendly farming, comply with regulatory requirements. We partner with the county in that we are providing the agricultural ombudsman services that you budgeted for. The Agricultural Ombudsman is helping the county and your agricultural stakeholders with identifying ways to comply with county regulations and opportunities for streamlining those regulations so that, they're, so that agriculture can remain viable here. We uh, work on this win-win for agriculture and, and through grants we have brought millions of dollars to farmers for water conservation, um, soil health, and all sorts of benefits that work within their business model and also to protect what we love on the coast. A great deal of that work is with ranchers, not just row crops. One of the benefits of working with ranchers environmentally is that you can reach vast tracts of land mm -hmm. and have a really big bang for your buck when you think about what you want to do for environmental health. I think often people don't realize quite how much benefit to a landscape cattle can be. Cattle. Um, are, can be used as a resource management tool that builds native grasslands, that improves wildlife habitat, that keeps water on the landscape, uh, that helps with uh, climate resilience, etc. A lot of our work also focuses on water quality. Water quality is a challenging issue on the coast. There are a number of, of creeks and water bodies that the county monitors. We partner with the county and allow the water quality monitoring. And water bodies that are listed under the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act, as impaired. The kind of work that we do is we do extensive water quality monitoring. And we do some small projects, property by property, some with volunteers, some with our staff. And we also do larger scale projects. So for example, this is the beach that's right behind Barbara's Fish Trap at Pillar Point Harbor, which has been listed as one of the most polluted beaches in California and the worst in Northern California and in various years, as impaired by, uh, by fecal bacteria. So we undertook, and that sign is a sign that the county posted in multiple languages to tell people um, that this poses a potential health hazard. And what you see in the distance at low tide is people collecting clams to eat. Mm -hmm. So um, given this concern, we undertook, we received a grant for about a million dollars from the State Water Resources Control Board and undertook a study to determine the sources of fecal contamination in the harbor. This is what I would consider a larger scale project. So the dyes that you see, see those pink and green plumes are when we dyed the harbor to study the circulation and understand how, where bacteria may go, for example. This is a project that was wrapped up and now we are partnering with many others, including the Harbor District, on improvements and ways to clean up that beach. My goal is that that sign comes down, and it will. The, uh, another way that we accomplished many of our goals is community building, community building and education while improving the environment. What you see here is akin to an old-fashioned barn raising. We work often with people in the confined animal community, equestrians, um, people who have chickens, llamas, goats, cattle, and help them be the stewards of water quality, help them own the water quality issue so that it doesn't happen in a way that's regulatory, but happens in a way that's voluntary, is more cost effective, and probably more far reaching. This project is an example of where somebody wanted to manage their manure, and there were a lot of people who wanted to learn how to do that. So we got a lot of people together from the community who helped this landowner set up a large commercial scale manure composting facility. All these other folks who attended learned how to do that on their properties. And now that compost is something that they can sell as a soil amendment, and a lot of people want it for their gardens. 
I want to talk with you a little bit about farm ponds. I'm realizing these pictures are too small. The, um, is this a, yeah, so the upper left photo, was, I put that in there because I want people to see what it looks like. To state the obvious, uh, in coastal San Mateo County, in San Mateo County, we don't have snowpack. So the water that everyone depends upon are these small creeks. That photo in the upper left corner is a pipe that goes into a creek. That's it. That's what happens. That's how a lot of the farms get their water. Sometimes it's from groundwater, et cetera. In the lower right, what you see is what a farm pond looks like. Often, that is pumped. They pump to the pond from a creek and sometimes from groundwater. In the lower left, you see one of the resources we're also trying to protect in addition to agriculture, and that's a salmon. It used to be that Pescadero Watershed, people came from all over the Bay Area to go coho salmon fishing. There were thousands of salmon in that watershed. It was extraordinary, and it's my goal that it looks like that again. There are a number of creeks that we have that um, can host large numbers of salmon and steelhead, and they have some, and they can, they can host more. Part of the way that we could do this is helping farmers have ag water supply reliability <laughs> by being able to have the kinds of ponds so that they can pump from the creeks during the winter when water is high, store that water to be able to use in the summertime so that the water that's in the creek stays there for the fish. Akin to these farm ponds, a project that we're working on with the county is to help Memorial Park, San Mateo County's Memorial Park, with which you're probably familiar um, and it's experiencing drought right now, had to close the campgrounds due to drought, to help that um, entire park get off the creek during the summer by building enough water, um, water storage and then treatment that the county has the water that it needs for people, but that water comes out of the creek when it's not a great limiting factor. Water conservation is a lot of what we do. The picture that you see on the right, again, when you're driving down the coast and you see these rolling hills, there's a lot of infrastructure there that you might not see. Often, a certain number of inches below the ground is an extensive network of pipes that takes water from um, where it's being pumped to where it's being delivered. We do a lot to improve the efficiency of that irrigation and water supply with residences, domestic use, as well as agriculture. On the left, you see what used to be called Nurserymen's Exchange is now Rocket Farms, one of the largest employers in agricultural operations on the coast. Um, this nursery, we work, we work with them on capturing rainwater from that extensive acreage of rooftop and recycling it to be able to use back on their own crops rather than taking from the creek. For this work, they won the Silicon Valley Water Conservation Awards and ceased to be Coastside County Water District's number one customer, for which they were rewarded by their rates going up. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that we do is um, a great deal of watershed planning. With these small creeks on the coast, there are competing demands and limited resources. This water is essential for agriculture, it's essential for domestic use, and it's essential for a number of threatened and endangered species that depend upon it. We have been involved in a number of processes where we bring people together to resolve some of those competing demands and to find a number of projects and operational agreements that they are willing to do voluntarily to balance those demands. We also do a lot of restoration work, direct restoration work, improving habitat complexity in creeks for the salmon, also for frogs, snakes, birds, and a number um, of different wildlife species that are considered to be in jeopardy, and many of whom coastal San Mateo County is one of the remaining homes. This is an example of a barrier to fish passage. So here's a creek, Frenchman's Creek, that some of you have seen with me. Um, that had a, a dam going across it. So you see that culvert that's perched. That culvert was because they had to build a road to get from one side of the creek to the other. They built an earthen dam and had the creek go through that culvert. That was put in by the Department of Fishing Game. That was legal. Um, our understanding of these issues has improved. And that posed a barrier to fish passage so that fish couldn't reach the up, upper several miles of this, of this watershed. We removed that and restored a more natural creek, revegetated that, and gave that landowner a bridge with grant funds. So the landowner was perfectly willing to do that, was very accommodating. It was a farm on both sides, and to help with this project, the farmer literally walked their harvest across the creek because they didn't have a bridge to do the harvest. That's how, that's how willing they were, what a good partner. This creek right here, you see a dam on the left, and the dam is removed on the right. That before and after picture is taken of San Francisco Creek, which is not within our district. It's, uh, it forms the boundary between the cities of Menlo Park and Palo Alto. 
by removing this dam that was an abutment that was helping a retaining wall to protect the Stanford tree, El Palo Alto, uh, formed a barrier um, to about 40 miles of, of access for steelhead trout in an essential watershed. We removed that dam with a number of partners to restore access to all of that uh, habitat. We are involved with a great deal of education and outreach with university students, with landowners, with environmental groups, with volunteers, with um, Spanish-speaking farm workers, um, all of our consti constituents. We are involved with a great deal of education outreach in a variety of forms. Another large area of, of interest for us has to do with climate readiness, climate resilience, and preparing for climate change and, and minimizing uh, climate change. We have been awarded um, some grants for using innovative technologies to use agriculture as a sink for carbon. In other words, to use agriculture to take carbon out of the environment in ways that improve crop yield, that are economically beneficial while also protecting us from the harmful effects of climate change. Ironically, many of these new technologies are really old technologies that we forgot. that are actually a few thousand years old ways to build soil health. We are also very involved with wildfire prevention. We partnered with um, CAL FIRE, the RCD of Santa Cruz County, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, several years ago to create a community wildfire prevention plan, which um, the members of this board at that time approved. San Mateo County adopted it. We also uh, have been involved with demonstration projects to try to protect people and demonstrate how people can take steps that are permittable. Permitting can be difficult to manage fuel load. In this example, you see that highly flammable stand of eucalyptus trees adjacent to a dense residential development on the coast. We did a project to limb and manage that fuel load and show people what they can do with minimal permits required so that it's, it's doable for them and affordable and minimizes fuel risk or fire risk. I wanted to highlight that we partner extensively with San Mateo County. This is a long list. The agricultural ombudsman that I mentioned before, the county contracts with us um, for on a number of, of projects. We're helping the county with stormwater management and compliance with, with um, some stormwater regulations. Um, we're partnering with the county on some habitat restoration and water quality monitoring efforts. County staff serve as technical advisors to us on a number of our projects, which we appreciate. Um, we, with, the, with assistance and advocacy from Supervisor Horsley's office and Carol Foster from your Department of Public Works, we've made it through a pretty rigorous selection process. We just applied for and looks likely that we will be awarded a $3.6 million grant for drought relief for coastal San Mateo County. Um, many, much of the work um, in that grant will be in partnership with the county. The county appoints our directors. So this board appoints our directors. Uh, we, um, we asked the county to take that responsibility because we could not afford elections. And the way that we are established allows the county to appoint our directors. Um, so this is actually a partial list. Our, our partnership with you is really, um, is really extensive, and we appreciate it very much. <clears throat> our budget from property taxes, our operating base, is $50,000 a year. We get a lot done with $50,000 a year, a year. And um, most of that is through leverage. That's a significant investment. Um, that $50,000 a year, at our last calculation, leveraged $42 in state and federal um, assistance for every dollar that we received in property taxes. And then recently, there's two significant things that this board did that we appreciate very much. One is that you have allowed us to get our property taxes, that $50,000 allotment, at the beginning of the year up front. That helps us substantially with our cash flow challenges. The second thing that you did recently is that you allocated $100,000 to us. $100,000 to us triples our operating base. It makes us <laughs> much, much more effective, uh, much more responsive to our constituents and to your constituents so that we can do um, more of the kind of work that we know brings benefits to the county. So we wanted to thank you for that very much. So my, my closing thoughts to you, uh, I guess what I hope you walk away with, um, is the idea that it is possible um, to protect what we love on the coast without regulations, that um, 
that, that that work that you saw that we're doing, that was just scratching the surface, is all voluntary, almost entirely free to constituents, and all based on a win-win model. To me, that's very exciting and very rewarding and why I continue to work here. And, um, and that all this contributes to a robust economy, recovery of threatened and endangered species, sustainable, clean water supply, safer communities. I think it helps with a lot of confidence in government that we literally are the government and we're here to help. And, um, and viable, sustainable agriculture. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, really, the, the breadth and depth of what uh, RCD does is, is really astounding, really remarkable. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, you know, the gentleman who is from Pacifica talked about that particular creek. Right. Could you, uh, would right. you mind following <laughs> up with him? Sure. <laughs> and, and yeah. uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. Very impressive work. Do we have any, any questions for for Kellex. I just I just want to add my two cents. I had the good fortune a couple years ago of going on a field trip with Kellex and was actually in that stream where she was working on saving the salmon, and I uh, think that you just do an amazing job on on really limited resources. Thank and you. want to thank you. Thanks. And we're going to take a tour on the upper uh, Butno uh, watershed. That's right. Get your chest waders ready. Waders and all the yeah. rest. <laughs> and uh, Thanks. I'll, I'll echo the remarks of uh, my colleagues. That, also had the good fortune to take a tour, and um, I, you know, kind of the bang for the buck from the RC RCD is incredible. And Remarkable. what makes an amazing difference, of course, is your personal passion for these issues. And you know, passion uh, is what really matters. And you are unique and remarkable with your passion, and it makes a big difference. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're now going to have a uh, CAL FIRE update on the fire season, which I think we never left and are certainly in for a while. Chief Jalbert. Thank you. Good morning, President Pine, honorable members of the board and county staff. Thank you for seeing me this morning. Scott Jalbert, I'm the uh, county fire chief and I'm also the CAL FIRE chief for the Semto Santa Cruz unit. Um, I'm here this morning to talk to you about our predictions of the 2014 fire season and what we can expect. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, predictive services and how we come up with our projections, uh, talk to you about the state of the state and how we're handling the situation, uh, talk a little bit about water concerns, and then finally uh, do a SWOT analysis with you. Um, so when we talk about fire seasons, uh, we always kind of compare uh, fire seasons to 1977, we call it the mother of all fire seasons. In fact, 1977 were uh, some of the, the biggest fires that the state had ever seen up to that point in time, the Marble Cone Fire, Malibu, Scarface. In fact, that year was when Firescope uh, invented uh, ICS, and then ICS eventually was adopted by NIMS and the federal government and now becomes law all throughout the, the lands. So. We compare fire seasons to that, and first off, 2013 was on track to be just like 1977. So for reference, this morning, um, I want to kind of focus on 2013 versus 2014 as a point of reference of where we are for fire conditions. Um, how, how we come up with uh, predicting fire, ser or fire season is a couple different factors. One of them is we analyze the snowpack. Uh, in the Sierras, uh, and then we really focus on the spring uh, snowpack, and we look at that and we look, understand what kind of water that we receive statewide. Uh, the other part is is precipitation, uh, and that in itself between February and May is the key factor. So what you see here is a picture of the snowpack um, in spring of 2013, and again, uh, keeping in mind that 2013, we had um, some very uh, large concerns about the fire season as it compared to 1977. This is 2014. Um, so that in itself, the snowpack was minimal. Um, snowpack was well below average statewide. Um, and again, it, it brings us to some concerns. The other part is, is precipitation. If you look on the right of the chart, you'll see what we experienced in 2013, again, being very concerned. Um, and this is uh, rainfall between October 1st to April 
Um, and if you look on the left, there we are in 2014, and the dark red denotes uh, extreme drought. Uh, in most cases, we're seeing precipitation uh, below 30% of what we normally receive. So you package the rainfall and the snowpack, and it kind of paints a picture for you of what, uh, how we predict fire season and what our concerns are. We also do, uh, we have professional, uh, as I call them, the weather scientists uh, and the fire scientists that get together and, and make predictions on potential for large and significant wildland fires. And here we are, this is a chart for 2013, uh, and it's kind of hard to see on this picture, but I'm sure you can figure out where the Bay Area is. Uh, we were in the, in the part where it says increasing to above normal potential for fires between June and July of 2013. Here's the picture for 2014 for June and July, and as you can see, it's above normal in the red, um, along with other parts of the nation. Um, next is our July and August predictions, and as you can see, in the majority of the coast of California and Northern California, parts of, um, you know, into other states, same conditions. So pretty, pretty extreme conditions. So on a local level, which is I want to kind of focus on, is uh, two things that are impacting us. One is the drought, uh, which has led to uh, a lot of uh, dead fuel that's already existing, uh, that's dead fuel. Uh, because we didn't receive a lot of moisture through the precipitation process, what has happened is those fuel conditions are as if they would be in August and September when we're talking about June, as an example. Uh, the other one on the bottom left, and you can't really see it, um, is what we call our 100-hour fuel moistures. We rate our fuels out there uh, based on size and uh, how much energy they can, they can release during a fire and how much moisture they can absorb. And it's kind of hard to see, but it's a green line, and that is the average. So that solid kind of green line that you see going across about the 15 percentile range. And the red line is the record, the lowest it's ever been. So when we indicate that fuel moistures are low, that's not a good thing. And as you can see, we're below average, and we are actually on track for 2013. The other thing that really hurt us was the late rains. We would have been better off with no rain than late rains this year. Uh, we received very little, if any, rain between November uh, and through February, and when we got in February, we got a lot of rain. Uh, and as you can see, this picture I just took uh, with, with the, uh, which is kind of fun because I had a herd of deer run right past me um, as they took it, and a lot of, uh, a lot of deers, in fact, I counted 22 at one herd. Uh, as you can see, the tall grass. Uh, that's problematic for us because grass is what carries fires. So we have extreme drought conditions with our fuels. We have grass crop that's larger than normal that can carry fires. Um, and the other part of this that we're also concerned about is the stress on the existing living fuels. So a lot of the live trees, uh, the oaks and the pine trees and so forth are really stressed because of the drought. And we're starting to see large numbers <coughs> of trees die uh, we're starting, in fact, uh, just the other day on Highway 17, we're seeing trees fall across Highway 17. Uh, that's unusual, and the reason why those trees are falling is because those trees are stressed, not that they have to see a counselor, but they're physically stressed <laughs> due to the drought. Uh, the other thing that we're concerned about is sudden oak disease. Um, the scrub oak and the, and the oak trees are impacting. There's been some studies that uh, found that when we're in drought conditions, the, the uh, the disease actually accelerates. If you drive along Highway 280, and if you look out towards the San Francisco watershed, you'll see patches of red trees. And it actually looks kind of pretty from a distance. Uh, but it's actually kind of scary up close, uh, because if those fuels ignite, we're, we're going to have some problems. This is what our energy release component is. And what this is, is that if there is a fire, how much fire can we expect to see from the given fuels? And you can see by the arrow, again, uh, we are above already the 2013 mark, and we are just below the maximum ERCs that have been recorded. So the higher the ERC, the worse off the conditions, the lower the fuel moistures, the worse off the conditions. So as you can see, we're right on track uh, for having some problems. 
As far as fire activity goes, I did a little research, and CZ, you'll say CZU fire activity. What that is is the designator for the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. And I went all the way back to 1967, and um, you can see where fire prevention really kind of came into play. These are, this is fire activity within the San Mateo Santa Cruz areas. And in 1967, we're having between 400 and 500 fires a year, uh, which is pretty extreme. And then you see the decline, which is pr pretty much it, towards 1977, which is when we really started as, um, as an agency and as government really started hitting hard on fire prevention. So you started to see a decline. But I want to take you all the way over to 2000, late 2012 into 2013, and you're starting to see a spike of fires. Um, I don't think we're seeing more starts. What I think we're seeing is that because the fuel conditions are so bad that areas that were normally won't ignite are starting to ignite and that's causing more fires in, in between both counties. Um, fire activity between January and June, and if you see to the left, and I just went back four years, that's your kind of average. We would average a handful of fires between that period, and then June we would start fire season, and then the activity would increase. As you can see, again, from 2012 to 2014, we're seeing close to 30 fires between that time period, which is, again, off the charts. This uh, chart represents the statewide activity between January and June. And on the left, you'll see the average. Uh, the blue is the fires. The red is the acreage. Uh, and it's kind of hard to dictate or uh, to see in this, uh, this chart. But two, 2014, we've had less acres burn. And that's because we haven't had the larger fires statewide. But we've actually seen a 55% increase of fire activities under normal conditions. So already we've burned or we've had more fires, a little less acreage statewide. Uh, and again, that's just because we haven't had any real large fires as of yet. So as far as the state of the state goes, what are we doing about it? Uh, well, the, the, the governor has given us an increase of four-person staffing on our state-funded fire engines, one-third of our engines statewide. Uh, for San Mateo County, our Pescadero Fire Station and our Belmont Fire Station both had an increase of staffing um, for four persons on the engine. And that four-person engine company makes a huge difference. You wouldn't think that one person would make a, a big difference. But what that does is it gives uh, a little more power to that engine company for their production rates to be able to chase those fires. And the nice thing is, believe it or not, just that one person alone uh, gives us the ability to reduce the commitment time on our apparatus. So for an example, where we may have to commit two or three engines to a fire for mop up, we may only have to now only commit one or two just based on that one person. So that makes a huge difference. Um, the state has entered into an agreement for a large air tanker. Um, Cal Fire has a... Um, a very large, robust fleet of fixed-wing and rotary-wing aircraft statewide. Our closest helicopters out of Elma, our closest air attack base, we have two of them, one out of Hollister and the next one out of Sonoma. Um, we've entered into a contract for a large air tanker. You guys have seen the DC-10, the big, we call that a VLAT, a very large air tanker. In the fire service, we have to have acronyms to, you know, sound like we know what we're talking about. Uh, so we just call this the large air tanker. Uh, and we and that the air tanker is going to be moved statewide uh, based on the need and the conditions. Uh, we're opening McClellan Air Attack Base. It's a reload base out of McClellan, out of the Sacramento area. What that does is it gives us the ability to lar to land large air tankers. So if and when we do get a fire here in San Mateo County, and we we need to use what we refer to as the heavies, and we bring in the heavy air tankers. Uh, before they would have to go all the way to Fresno to reload and come back because of the runway situation. We now have an air base that's a lot closer and the turnaround time uh, for the aircraft would be um, a lot quicker. Um, we did see early fire activity and we increased our peak staffing. In 2013, we went to what we call peak staffing. So for the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, normally we don't even start fire season until June 1st. And June 1st, we staff 10 engines in both counties. And then July 1st, we add another two engines. And we go to what we call peak staffing. Last year, we went straight to peak staffing May 1st. This year, we went straight to peak staffing May 19th. So we're about a month ahead, a month and a half ahead of schedule to be at peak staffing. 
Uh, talk a little bit about water, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this. Um, water is definitely a problem, and as we've seen, the coastal areas of uh, San Mateo County, Santa Cruz County, Monterey, San Luis Obispo have been hit really, really hard uh, with the rainfall. Uh, and a lot of our water sources come from creeks or wells up in the, in the rural areas of the county. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, that green line represents what the average water flow is, how many cubic uh, gallons per second that these creeks provide. And as you can see very simply, the San Gregorio and Pescadero creeks are well below normal, which is problematic for us. So water is kind of the key subject this year. Governor Brown, um, my other boss, I have five bosses, he's one of them. Uh, Governor Brown, uh, obviously we in, uh, invented the uh, drought task force for the state. Um, and again, because of all the water problems that we have. Um, one of the other issues is accessing private water sources. So uh, in the rural areas, we don't have the luxury of a lot of fire hydrants. So we have to rely on private water sources if that be a water tank, if that, for an example, someone's swimming pool, um, or be able to draft out of a creek if necessary. Uh, again, since that water table is reduced, those options are, are reduced as well, and it's obviously a concern. The other thing we're starting to see, at least in Santa Cruz, and it hasn't really hit here yet, and I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but uh, thievery of water. Uh, we've actually had cases where people are tapping into people's private water sources and stealing water. And I'm not talking a couple gallons or a canteen. I'm talking tens of thousands of gallons of people's uh, private water supply. Um, in, in areas where there are hydrants in rural areas, you're starting to see a lot of wet spots around the hydrants. To me, that's an indication someone's tapping into those hydrants and taking the, that water. So it's obviously a concern. The other thing is, is, is our local recreational areas through county parks. Uh, I've been working very closely with uh, Director Finley with uh, San Mateo County Parks. Uh, as you all know, uh, Memorial Park uh, has been closed uh, for camping. Um, it, is, it is problematic. Um, state parks are in the same situation. I've been working with Superintendent uh, Bardot with state parks. She's my counterpart. Uh, on the park system. Uh, they've already closed Castle Rock State Park, which is up towards Highway 9. Uh, they're also looking at having to possibly make some closures due to the same reasons um, to uh, Patola State Park. With all this being said, um, it, it gives a trend as we get later on to the year. So what are the impacts? Uh, the impacts are that most likely our state crews and our local crews are going to be gone more. Um, the, obviously, we've talked about the water resources being reduced. Um, and because of all this stuff, um, most likely, uh, I'm going to be compelled under public resource code to enact more stringent uh, burning restrictions in the state responsibility areas uh, in both counties. Uh, that could include up to uh, not allowing any warming fires uh, in even the campfires that you would typically go camping uh, and have a little ring and roast your marshmallows, uh, I would probably have to shut all of that down based on the fuel conditions. Prevention-wise, um, we have uh, conducted over uh, 2,351 defensible space inspections just in this county alone. Uh, we've been working with uh, FireSafe and, and, and also the RCD uh, and to doing some fuel reduction programs uh, for to make our communities more fire safe under CWPP. Uh, we've spent 190 crew days. Uh, we've been working on shaded fuel breaks and fuel reduction projects in just some areas to mention in the Highlands and Woodside and, and in the city areas as well when we can uh, have the capacity to do that. Um, also in the state and county parks. So to kind of put it all together to do a kind of a SWAT, um, our strengths are that we have really good paid and volunteer firefighters throughout the county. They're trained well in wildland fire operations. Um, we do have a robust um, resource availability for fire resources countywide. We're pretty lucky in this county. We have a lot of resources. We can move resources very quickly. That's when they're available and when they're in the county. Um, we have a good fire plan. The fire plan is our prevention plan for the unit. Uh, we've been working very hard with that, uh, with all of our stakeholders and cooperators uh, to make our areas more fire safe. And we have a great fire safe council that we work very closely with. 
Um, so our opportunities is, is now's the time to educate the public. Uh, CAL FIRE in itself um, statewide is, is putting on some public service announcements. Uh, you may see some of them in the media market. Also our local union, uh, 2081, has been doing some work locally. Um, we do have the availability for some grant funding from the state responsibility area fees. Uh, just recently they've released $10 million statewide for uh, fuel reductions grants. Uh, and we're going to apply for some of those grants and hopefully, again, continue with uh, hitting it a little harder than we normally do with fuel reduction. Um, we have a great training program with allied agencies. Uh, Cal Fire and the San Mateo County Fire Department, we work well with other agencies. We train a lot. We just did a large drill in Woodside to prepare for fire season. So that's all good. Uh, our weaknesses is that we have a heavy fuel loading problem in the county. Um, a lot of heavy fuels, especially in the areas, some of the local areas like Devonshire Canyon, Palomar Park, Emerald Hill, some of those what we call wooey areas, wildland urban interface areas. Huge fuel loads. A lot of that has to do with the lack of fire history. This county does not have a huge fire history. Um, and so throughout the years, the fuel tends to grow and then becomes problematic. Um, again, uh, our, the condition of the county fire apparatus, um, we were very fortunate to receive um, some Measure A dollars, and we are in the process of rebuilding our county fire fleet thanks to this board. Uh, but till we get there, we still have some issues with some older apparatus, specifically our water tenders. Uh, I do have some concern. Our water tenders are 1974 water tenders. We are uh, in the process of ordering a new one right now, uh, but it takes about six months to a year to get it delivered. So we'll just hope that keeps going. Um, and I already talked about the lack of fire, uh, major fire experience in the county. Um, large fires are problematic. When we get a large fire, it involves a whole host of agencies, including the board. It's going to involve county OES. It's going to include the sheriff's uh, uh, office. It's going to include all the fire services, Red Cross. Um, and because we don't have that fire history, which is a good thing in this county, when and if we do get a fire, it's going to be a little problematic at first. Uh, but we'll get through it and we'll build upon that experience if it, if it does ever happen. Our threats, um, the biggest threat that we have right now is that all of our, all of our fires are going to be fuel driven. And what that means is, is that there are three factors that influence wildland fire behavior. Fuels, weather, and topography. So if we have the right weather conditions and we have the right topography set up, meaning that the fire starts to burn up a slope, automatically we're going to have a fuel-driven fire. So it's one of the components is given on any day, and you add those two other components, and we have the potential for large fires. Um, activity could be, uh, we could have an opportunity not just, no, I'm, I'm sorry, not opportunity, but there could be a chance at activity, not just locally, but regionally. So for an example, yesterday, you probably watched the news at San Jose, uh, had a couple of fires in the Santa Teresa Hills. They had another fire that broke at the same time off Dinosaur, uh, um, I'm sorry, Casa de Fruta off Highway 152. That was a huge draw of resources. We had to bring in, right now as, as today, our engines are gone on fires in the Santa Clara unit, and I have a strike team of engines covering from Sonoma Lake Napa into our unit right now and things are kind of slow. Uh, we already talked about the, the uh, drought being hit hard in the Bay Area and the coastal areas. Um, and we do have a large amount of wooey areas in this county. We have a lot of urban interface issues uh, in the Woodside Hills. And, and this is also just not in county areas. This is also in the city areas, the town of Hillsboro, uh, areas of Ladera Oaks and, and Menlo Park area. Uh, some of the areas that are outside the unincorporated areas also have these issues in Redwood City as well. Bottom line is, is if we do have some fires, they are going to be costly if they are major incidents, and it's something that we just need to be prepared for. And with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. It was very, um, very helpful presentation. Uh, just, questions? Uh, just the one comment. Uh, one of the things, so eucalyptus trees, there's an awful lot of eucalyptus on the coast, especially in El Granada. Are, and I know we were talking to Marlene Finley the other day about the drought. They are also showing signs of, of stress. Yes. Yes. And they are very, when they burn, they're explosive. Yeah, about, well, in my opinion, as a fire professional, the only thing eucalyptus trees are good for are for koala bears. Um, 
they are problematic um, and they do cause a problem and they are and they are stressed and, and the amount of, of uh, vegetation that they drop the litter on the ground is also yeah anytime we get a fire in eucalyptus actually that first picture that you saw was the trabing fire and that fire was fueled by a eucalyptus yes and you know we t we're talking about the fuel reduction using uh, it used to be that the state crews and even the county crews are, are they still well, I guess because of realignment, they may not be as available anymore. Yeah, uh, we still have our crews, uh, AB 109 with, with the line. We still have our six fire crews. We used to at one point in time have county crews, the county fire safe crews with yeah. the sheriff's office, and those went away. Um, but we do still have our six crews. Those six crews are respond. I'm sorry, five crews. That was my dream, six crews. Yeah. Five crews. We have our five uh, inmate crews out of our Ben Lomond fire camp. And they're responsible all the way from San Francisco and all the way to Monterey. So they are spread thin and they are tied up on a lot of projects. But you still have them then? We still do have them, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, uh, thank you very much. Very, very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we uh, will receive a re agricultural crop report. Um, from our agricultural commissioner. I have to apologize. This presentation is going to be from the age of adding machines and mimeographs. Um, I don't have any PowerPoint. I'm just going to have to speak my way through it and hold up props, OK? So we all have um, that, too. Good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors, President of Pine, Deputy Manager for all this, and uh, Council Buyers. Thank you for the opportunity to present the 2013 Annual Crop Report for San Mateo County, as well as our Economic Contributions Report. Um, I am Fred Crowder, the County's Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer of Weights and Measures. And um, because I have two reports here, I'm going to endeavor to be particularly brief. But when done, we'll be happy to take any questions you have, and I can meet with you individually if you'd like to discuss further. So um, the numbers I'll provide for the crop report are rounded. And so if you'd like to see specific numbers um, or exact numbers, please ref refer to the report itself. But um, this past year, on our 2013 crop report, um, the overall value for the San Mateo County crops was uh, um, $143 million. This was a 2.2% 2 2 2 increase. Over last year, we had a value of $141 million. And though it's relatively small, it's, um, I think it's significant because uh, this is the second consecutive year that we've had increases in the value for the crop report um, after falling each year since 2007. So the largest changes in this year's report were in vegetable crops and in the fruit and nursery crops, or excuse me, floral and nursery crops. And um, starting with the floral and nursery crops, they constitute about 77% of our overall production value. And those particular crops this past year dropped um, from $113 million last year to $110 million this year, um, a $3.4 million <coughs> reduction, which is a little bit unexpected um, given that we're apparently in full economic recovery. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen is, I think, some little bit of a hangover from the economic crisis itself and that we've had a, a number of operations that have gone out of business this past year, floral and nursery operations, as well as businesses that are in transition. Um, the loss of production of those businesses contributed to the decline of $3.4 million within that particular um, segment of our industry. So we'll also see a, a video later uh, when, I'm when I conclude about one of those transitions um, with Supervisor Horsley. So vegetable crops, that's, a, uh, that's actually a highlight in this year's report. They jumped from, um, let's see, what did they do? They jumped from 17 million to 22.6 million dollars this past year, an increase of 5.2 million dollars. Um, a particular note in that was Brussels sprouts, San Mateo County favorite, jumped yes, yay, jumped by uh, 5.2 million dollars. <laughs> so um, another one that that's kind of amazing is fava beans. I'm not quite sure what that's about, but fava beans went from six 653 thousand dollars to over a $2 million crop this past year. We saw an increase in acreages, um, increase in value. I hate and, those things. You know, <laughs> yeah, Don, they go great with a nice Chianti. So anyway, um, artichokes dropped this past year. Um, that's, that's continuing a trend that we have been seeing. 
And, um, you know, there's, there's a, a seeded variety of artichoke that was introduced a number of years ago um, that you can plow out. It's not like the perennial varieties. Um, it's, it's very productive. It does well in warm areas. It's not coastally dependent. Um, and that has provided significant competition to our, breast, our, uh, our artichoke industry. And, and so we saw a reduction there. However, um, I, I was going to say another downer is the field crops and the livestock. Those are typically dry land um, crops. And with the drought, we've seen that um, there's less plantings of those and less yields. Um, livestock, that's a resource dependent um, commodity. You know, de cattle are dependent on range. And if there's no range, um, cattlemen reduce the size of their herds. And we're, we're seeing that now. So um, before moving on to the economic report, I want to give a shout out to David Lung. He was our deputy director um, for many years for our weights and measures program. And I worked with David in 1985 down in Santa Barbara County. Um, when I started there, we shared a desk. And then I ran across him again in San Francisco County back in 1997. And so when I came to work here, I was pleasantly surprised and pleased to find David was um, one of the directors in the department. And um, he is very happy to be retired. I am not happy that he is retired. Um, but I and the staff are going to miss him. So on to the economic report. I'll hold up the, the graphic here. Um, this builds on the, the crop report itself. Um, the crop report is just sheer numbers as to what is the value of the crop itself. The agricultural economic report um, goes through and it takes a look at indirect um, effect, effects of um, that industry. It looks at induced effects of that industry. And you know, by, by taking a look at that, we can idea what the economic contributions of, of our agricultural industry are within the community. Um, we get an idea as we can assess the agricultural industry, industry's strength and its resiliency, and also provide some insights as far as policy development. The um, indirect effects are essentially business to business transactions. And that is when a farmer buys um, soil amendments, feed, fertilizer, seeds, um, starts, has pest prevention services, those are business to business transactions. And those are not captured in the crop report itself, but the economic report um, does capture those. There's also induced economic effects, which is essentially um, consumer spending by members of the agricultural industry, whether that's the grower or if that's employees, and that's things for housing, services, clothing, food, um, health care, those types of things. And so those are the induced effects. And so considering you know, what we have as far as direct effects, the induced effects, and the um, indirect effects, we see that um, for San Mateo County, for every dollar produced in our crop report, um, you know, this year it was $143 million, we see about 58 cents additionally generated in induced and indirect costs within the community. That's the economic contribution. So for 2011, which is the year that, this, that the economic contribution report actually addresses, we had $137 million in agricultural production, um, when you when you factored in the induced effects and the indirect effects, we found that there was about another seventy nine million dollars in additional in additional benefit to the economy, totaling about two hundred and sixteen million dollars. That doesn't seem like very much given San Mateo County's size and um, and the, the industries that we have here, but ninety four percent of all of that was on the coast side. That's really where our our um, economic community, our agricultural community, is focused, and so. 216 million on the coast side is, is something significant. So um, for comparison, we did a similar, or we didn't do a similar study, but Santa Cruz County did a study as well. Um, and they found a multiplier of about 2.57 there in Santa Cruz. San Luis Obispo, they did a similar study. Their multiplier is about 2.54. Santa Barbara had a multiplier of 2.41. Of 2 and Monterey County produced a multiplier of 2.0. So, you know, San Mateo County's multiplier is 1.58. Why is that? Um, I mean, one, you look at these are billion dollar industries in Monterey, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo. Um, they are the 300 pound gorilla under which essentially the community is built and, and dependent on. So the multipliers are much higher, whereas San Mateo County, agriculture is important, but it's not the economic driver um, and the economic focus that these other communities have. Um, there's also very little. Um, agricultural infrastructure in San Mateo County. When our growers um, need services, they don't. There's there's very few services here available in San Mateo. They need to go down to Watsonville, Monterey, and Santa Cruz County in order to get those services. So those are all dollars that are actually leaving San Mateo County. Um, let's see. 
And I guess that pretty much covers really the, I think the two main reasons why we, why we have such a low multiplier there. So, but really looking at the report, there were no surprises. Um, we didn't see anything here that, that, that jumped out at us. Um, the recommendations of it were very similar to what the county is doing at this point in time. Um, we, have, we have zoning in place to protect our agricultural lands. Um, we have the, we're supporting the Williamson Act. Um, we have um, agritourism and value added agricultural um, support policies. We're looking at our permit, we're reviewing our permit process through the agricultural ombudsman and looking ways to streamline that permit process and reduce the burden on our agricultural producers and to facilitate the permitting process for them. And then we're also looking at the As Fresh As It Gets program to, to promote local agriculture awareness of local grow, grown products and, um, and to educate the public. So moving forward, um, we might consider county policies that allow agriculture to diversify and, and avail itself of, of new opportunities, whether those are new crops, to diversify crops, to diversify crop prediction methods. Um, we might also consider policies that encourage the development of ag support businesses, um, tax reductions, or some kind of incentives to try to bring some sort of support businesses here so that those dollars aren't all going south down to Watsonville. So let's see. Diversification was an element that was mentioned in the report as well. And we have a very focused community um, within our agriculture. And for a small agricultural community like San Francisco, excuse me, San Mateo, um, diversifying can be a challenge, but it's important that it be recognized and, um, and addressed so that we can build resilience into our system and make sure that we have policies that, that, uh, that support that. So, and like I said, this is, this, this is something that we're already doing and this report helps focus that effort. Something that I'll be coming with um, Dr. Scott Morrow in a, I think a month or so is the ag feasibility, is the uh, agriculture, was it the uh, Farms to Institutions um, feasibility study that was done last year. And that report has some recommendations within it as far as ways to support not only getting food to institutions, but also our farming community. So. Um, I think before I quit, I would like to thank my staff who worked in preparing these reports, especially Kelly Mayer. Um, she did all the formatting for actually both of these reports. And every year we've had a, a nicer report that's been more attractive and more informative and, and she just does a great job. So thank you for your time and attention. I'd be glad to take any, any questions that you might have. Thanks, Brad. If, if you don't have any questions, there's actually a video I wanted to uh, have the uh, my colleagues see that's actually is a, a young farmer. He's actually not young. Anybody under 50 to me is young, <laughs> but he is a, he runs Pie Ranch, and it really is, a, as a, so many of you probably have already met him. Um, and uh, in any case, I'll let you see this video, but it really shows a transition of, you know, we do have, we ha our floral industry is not done very well, and Sheriff would appreciate this. In Columbia, the U.S. government to encourage people to stop growing cocaine had them grow carnations. And of course, that has kind of wiped out our floral industry. So it's good for law enforcement, bad for the floral industry. Yeah. So, so can you run that uh, video? <clears throat> There's this beautiful tradition of family farming on the coast that's quietly and rapidly disappearing. And we don't want to see that happen. There's all this knowledge of the soils, the water, the climate, what it takes to produce crops. We don't want to see that disappear. The Garibaldi family came over from Italy in 1892. I'm the fourth generation, my son and daughter the fifth. Our family came to Pescadero to grow in this nice ranch 44 years ago. The flower market was good in the early days, and we did it for 40-something years, and, and we're successful at it. At one time, there were 48 vendors that grew their own stuff. Then it started changing. South America got involved. Everything we grew, they grew, and they grew it better and cheaper. In the last 10 years when the business kind of started going south and then the decision was made a year ago to call it quits and it was pretty heart-wrenching. 68 years going to the market and you just cold turkey quit when five generations have been doing this. That was hard to take.
Over the last 10 years, we at Pi Ranch have developed a diverse operation and educational farm. We have been looking for a partner to scale what we've learned to a sustainable working farm. The Onion Nuevo site offered the perfect venue to do this. Out of nowhere, this nice gentleman living across the street from us came in to visit us. We start talking and immediately we hit it off. We said, this is gonna work. We're not just looking at um, creating a sustainable farm, um, but we're really wanting to have, from production all the way through to consumption, be sustainable. We needed the upfront operating capital and customer base to make this idea a reality. One of the unique aspects of Google being located on Mountain View is we're so close to so many great farms. And what we're trying to do over here is to provide Googlers with delicious, nutritious, local food, but actually make the connection with food as well. So as a large organization, we have committed that we're going to buy this year and over the years to come a large part of his farm production up front. So we're providing with the cash flow, so actually he doesn't have to worry about will he be able to pay the bills as he's waiting for his crops to grow. This project is giving us the opportunity to develop a, an innovative CSA. In a traditional CSA, you have a group of customers in your community who support a farm financially throughout the season and in return get a share of the harvest. Google is committing in advance like a CSA member would. This not only allows us to take the best care of the land, but also the people who are working the land. I get to keep my crew and that meant a lot. I told Jared, I'm on board only if you keep these guys, because if not, I don't want to stay, you know. Without them, we're nothing. They know the soil, they know the systems. If it weren't for them, we would not be able to hit the ground running and growing the diversity of crops that we wanted. It helps that local community, Pescadero, to remain viable. It helps us to connect actually Googlers with the original food, a farmer. We're going to be able to integrate what's being eaten in the cafe during the day coming from the farm with what can be taken home by an employee uh, over the weekend. The Schmidt Family Foundation's mission is to support programs that are environmentally and economically viable and support local communities. Which is why we are working closely with the two partners, Pi Ranch and Google, to prototype a new financing model that enables smaller farms to sell their produce upfront and directly to large organizations and stabilize their cash flows. So the Schmidt Family Foundation has played a critical role by providing us financing. And that helps us take care of some of the immediate needs of getting started, like buying equipment. But beyond that, this allows us to develop a whole new supply chain option for farmers. We're excited we've got our first planting of wheat and barley and vegetable crops like the peas and fava beans and chard and kale. Um, so we're, we're rolling. Now the ranch, I look, it's like, okay, we got wheat growing out there and it's like, okay, that's a first. I've never seen it. We're you know, gonna eventually have animals and pasture. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know, but I'm excited about it. it it's, it's a change in the right direction. We're gonna continue on as far as we can go. We're just super excited about the potential of, of having this model move us from an anonymous food system to one where relationships help to drive sustainability. So success for me would be if large organizations over here in the Bay Area, in the US or around the world, would actually learn from this model and apply it and probably do it even better than we can imagine as of today. And that's one of the things I see on the coast side, that a lot of our farmers are really transitioning and coming up with remarkable models. And this is one of, the, one of them. The reason they called it Pie Ranch is that in a smaller ranch, they did grow wheat and strawberries, and they would actually, from scratch, make their own pies, and that's why they, that was kind of their claim to fame. And it's, uh, it's, uh, but it, but it, they're remarkable uh, people who are figuring out new ways of marketing local food. And uh, I thought I wanted to share this with the board. <coughs> Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Awesome film. And uh, thank you, Mr. Crowder. Any questions for Mr. Crowder? Well, thank, thank you, you for your presentation.
Okay, at 2 o'clock today, we are going to have a, a study session on homelessness. Um, so everyone is invited to join us then. Uh, we'll now move to uh, item 5. Um, I'll turn it over to County Council uh, John Byers to uh, describe this item. Great. Th thank you, President Pine. I, I appreciate it. And I am very honored and, and uh, excited to bring this uh, salary ordinance amendment uh, forward uh, today. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, when the board um, at Supervisor Tissier's request um, adjourned in memory of our former county council, uh, Michael Murphy, who, um, as you know, lost his battle with cancer on, uh, on June 5th, um, I mentioned I would be bringing forward um, a proposal to start a fellowship uh, program in my office to be named uh, after Mike. Uh, the county manager and, uh, and the director of human resources are, are very much uh, um, in support of, of this idea. Um, Specifically, um, here's how it would work. Um, I'm respectfully uh, requesting that, uh, that this board amend the uh, salary ordinance to add, add one deputy uh, county council fellowship uh, position uh, to our office. The fellowship um, would be named um, after Mike. Um, specifically, it would be named the Michael P. Murphy Impact Litigation uh, slash Public Law Fellowship. It would be a two-year position. Uh, reserved for a new law graduate, and every two years we would uh, recruit uh, to fill the position uh, anew. We were looking for a way to, to honor Mike, uh, um, and at the same time, uh, it has been apparent for some time uh, that we, we ought to have a specialized position uh, in our office for, for a new law graduate. Uh, I mean, the harsh reality is that, uh, that you know, recent law graduates have a a hard time competing in our, in our office when we do have an opening. Uh, you know, we need to uh, fill our, we don't have openings very often when we do, we, we need to fill those positions with, um, with lawyers who have some experience who we can, to fill an immediate need so we can kind of plug them in to represent clients. Um, that said, we, we do have a need for, uh, for a newer lawyer to, to take on interesting um, public law research projects. Uh, and also help us with our increasing um, impact litigation practice where we are the plaintiffs, such as lead paint litigation. It's an example of impact litigation that we're, we're, we're doing. So not only does the office benefit, but, um, but the new attorney benefits because they would get invaluable legal training in our office and exposure to public sector law uh, that they might not uh, otherwise uh, obtain. Naming the fellowship uh, after Mike... Um, I think is fitting. Uh, Mike was a, um, as, as you know, was a mentor to so many uh, less experienced lawyers, just in terms of, um, of how he went about uh, practicing law. You know, he kind of, I, I think he showed the best side of our profession. He worked hard. Uh, he was a zealous advocate, but um, at the same time, he maintained um, the utmost of integrity and, um, and highest of, of ethical standards. Um, so I, I really think it would be an honor for any any newly uh, kind of newly minted lawyer to uh, to receive this fellowship in, in Mike's uh, Mike's name. With us today, I'm 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 thrilled that we have uh, Mike's wife Gail and uh, older daughter oldest daughter Erin. Uh, and I do know that Gail would like to just take a moment to say say a couple words. Hello. I just wanted to thank you for considering this and thank the County Council for proposing it. Michael would be quite honored, so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Byers, for that very uh, elegant summary and introduction of the matter. Uh, any, any questions or comments from the board? I'd just like to um, introduce the ordinance. Very good. I have seconds the uh, motion. So we do have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I do. Ms. Horson? Yeah, just talking about uh, Mike, uh, I, I always knew he was a really kind person, and, and I, I also knew that he was a great advocate for the county. And in fact, all, I find all of the county council people the same way. But after going to the service and learning about all the other parts of it that I didn't know about the being able to play a violin, I felt like. Gee, uh, this guy is really an accomplished person that uh, I, I didn't know that side of him, so it's nice to hear that side of him, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly proud of the, that we're able to do this uh, in honor of uh, Mike. Okay, well, th thank you very much for your support. Really you know, I, I think this is you know, a wonderful way to, 
to uh, honor um, Mike Murphy. And, you know, oftentimes buildings are named after people and that has its place, but this is a very creative, unique um, idea. And I think there'll be in tremendous uh, interest from law students um, because of the unique opportunity it would be to you know, work with uh, our really strong county council office and then to have a, a time where you, know, you could you know, work on, as you say, impact litigation. Um, so we will have, a, I think, an abundance of talent that will be interested in this, in this job. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's a good, good move. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, our next item, uh, we'll, we'll do two things here. We, the sheriff was uh, uh, slated to give a director's report, and uh, Sheriff Monks, it probably makes sense to do that one first, and then we can move over to the other, the second item uh, concerning the Alameda transfer. Um, sure. I was actually going to do the, the uh, whatever contract you think first. Is, yeah, and then I'll introduce the assistant sheriff to do the. Yeah, whatever, however you okay, want to do it. Perfect. Okay, okay. Right, perfect. Uh, President Pine, honorable board members, uh, Ms. Rallis. Um, you have before you an agreement with Alameda County Sheriff's Office for, to provide for housing of inmates in their county. Um, it is uh, our intent, uh, you might recall, I think it was a year, year and a half ago, when I was here to talk about overcrowding and what we were gonna do in response to realignment. And the plan was that we were going to, um, we had already fixed up uh, MSF, the medium security facility, as a uh, kind of a release or uh, emergency housing option. Uh, but the other piece of that was to enter into a contract with another county for the provision of housing if, if needed. Uh, I do not anticipate having to utilize this, uh, but it's something that we wanna have. It's, it's taken quite a while to work the contract agreement out. So um, we just wanna have it in place in the event that uh, the population spikes between now and the completion of the jail project. Um, there's a number of other uh, unforeseen uh, events that might uh, prompt us to have to use this short term. Uh, if the drought ever ends and we get uh, rain once again, uh, Supervisor Horsley will remember that uh, the women's facility uh, tends to flood and that facility is in a very bad condition. We most recently had to evacuate one of the dorms and put 34, 36 women over in McGuire while we did extensive uh, uh, repairs to that uh, pod or that uh, that dorm. So you know, in the event that the uh, that facility suffered more uh, serious uh, problems, we might have to seek housing elsewhere. Um, also, we re received money from SB 1022. At some point, we're going to be doing uh, renovations to McGuire, the old McGuire. Uh, one of those floors, we're going to have to evacuate or move out while we do that. We're not sure if we're going to have to uh, move the whole. Uh, facility out. Uh, our plan is to wait until the new facility is completed before we do that. But again, you know, we're, we just want to be uh, prudent and have this as a uh, option. From a population standpoint, I don't anticipate us uh, increasing to the point where we're going to have to uh, take advantage of this uh, contract from a just a standard population standpoint. We're, we seem to be able to move people around and manage the system um, as it's currently um, at the rate that it, it currently is. But again, we just want to have that uh, in our um, repertoire of, of options uh, going forward. So with that, I would uh, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Monks. I did have a couple of questions, many of which you've addressed in your, uh, in your opening comments there. Could you just give us a, um, a snapshot of the current inmate, inmate population and uh, I know that we're the memo said we're averaging 912 at McGuire, but you know what? Just approximately, what are our counts in the? Sure, uh, you know the uh, assistant sheriff. I'm going to have covered the under the director's report kind of population trends, but you know just briefly, uh, the the male population is is uh, kind of stabilized after uh, after realignment. Um, I think it's now in the low 900s right now. Uh, the women's population has been more problematic. Uh, that is, uh, last time I looked, about 130, which is uh, pretty uh, overcrowded given that the facility is rated for 84 women. Um, realignment has disproportionately impacted the, the female population. Uh, again, not being precise, but uh, I think the male population has increased about 10%. The women's population has increased between 30 and 40%. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
again, there hasn't been a whole lot of study on that, but I think intuitively I would say that women tend to uh, commit the non-non-non offenses uh, more as a proportion of the total as opposed to the men who have, you know, there's more violent uh, offenses in there. So uh, anyway, our, I'm more concerned about the, the female population uh, in terms of hitting that, that point. I think if we, uh, anything, once we hit 150 or so, we're in pretty, um, pretty dire straits. And, uh, but our staff has done an outstanding job of balancing the, you know, we have an overflow housing unit in McGuire. We have the women's transitional facility in, um, out there on Maple Street. So again, unless uh, something, unless it, it continues to increase and we hit that number, I don't anticipate uh, having to seek outside um, beds. That overflow housing unit, so are there any women in McGuire currently? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, do we have any right now? On the medical floor. Yeah. In the medical side. How many, do you know? Yeah, so we have some special housing over there, yeah, yeah. and so those women, but we're not utilizing overflow housing at the moment. Okay, okay. So yeah, and then you addressed uh, you know, the question about when you know when this would trigger. You know, it's amazing. Back in two hundred seven, two hundred eight, you know, our populations were just so high. We had uh, uh, thousand twelve people in McGuire, and I think it, I think you probably had people in the place that we didn't want them at that point. Right, uh, get them in. We had uh, converted um, treatment areas, the, the classrooms, into housing. Right. So, um, but as you've discussed, your your current thinking is is we may we may get to the new jail without having to util utilize this. I anticipate that we will, but There's barring some unforeseen event or um, increase in the population, uh, about a we have a. Overall plan that uh, triggers, and I, and I think for the male population, it's probably at about 1,100. Yeah. When you know, uh, so we can go up to about 1,100 before people have to start being housed on the floor, and that's where we would, you know, draw the line. Gotcha. And 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 it sounds like women, you might have women transfer to Alameda, not just men. If I had to bet that we were going to do uh, any of those beds, I would guess that it would be with uh, the female population because they are closer to the, um, you know, kind of the trigger point in terms of running out of space. But uh, I'm hopeful that between the overflow housing in McGuire, the women's transitional facility, and um, uh, what we have there, uh, we're going to make it through until the opening of the new facility. Okay, okay that's helpful. Uh, any other questions? Well, yeah, I do have one. Oh, actually, it has to do with the women's uh, population. And, and, you know, I, I've always thought that we should look at electronic home monitoring. And I know you have some concerns about it, but would you be willing now to reconsider, especially – Would it seems to me that it would be better to have a really intensive electronic home monitoring program for women as opposed to sending them to Alameda County. I mean, I, I know you have some concerns about liability, but I, I don't really think that you have any greater liability than – for any other activity that the sheriff has, but. Yeah, no, I, I've uh, felt, and I think I've shared this with the board before, uh, I'm not a big fan of electronic home detention. Uh, I think that the, the decision on uh, jail or not, not, not going to jail is a decision best left for the bench. Uh, I think our judges do a very good job of listening to the whole uh, background, the probation report. Uh, they are elected to do that. I am not elected to make those decisions. And um, I think that our use of jail as a sanction and or as a protection of the public is uh, very um, well uh, managed. That's why we have one of the lowest incarceration rates in the state. And we have one of the smallest uh, jail systems uh, in the state. San Francisco, who has the same number of people that we have, has three times the uh, rated beds that we do. So our problem is our system's too small for our county. And I think, though, we do a very good job of managing it under the circumstances. No, I, I agree with that. But if the judges were uh, authorized electronic home monitoring for certain uh, of your clients or prisoners, would you be willing to ramp your program up? It, it, I, at least I don't think it's very ramped up now. But. Well, what we do and what I believe electronic monitoring is helpful for is to 
help step people out of custody. So uh, we plan in conjunction with our strategic implementation plan to utilize it more in support of reentry. And, and that's where I think it, it's helpful. Uh, many of the people that are in custody, home is like the worst place for them to be <laughs> because uh, you know there, there's lack of structure, there's a lack of, um, uh, you know, many of the uh, things that led their, to their ending up in jail uh, have to do with the environment in, in, in the lack of structure that exists uh, at home. Uh, many of our people don't have places to go and, and uh, that's why they end up in, in jail sometimes. So um, I don't think that there's a, a large population of people there sitting there that could go home and do better. And uh, you know, going to the drug court graduations or the uh, choices um, uh, events, you know, I hear constantly people saying that it's jail that finally got them to turn their lives around. It's jail that finally got, got them to hit the bottom and uh, really get to that point, which I think our probation chief uh, says it very uh, eloquently when he talks about readiness to change. And uh, many of the programs that we put on uh, aren't effective until people have that readiness to change. And uh, in my opinion, sitting at home watching TV doesn't get people ready to change. And um, I'm quite concerned about um, the trend in California with realignment. Uh, I think as a county, we're doing a very good job uh, with realignment, but um, just in our jurisdiction, since June 1st, we've had 25 residential burglaries in, in just Portola Valley, Woodside, San Carlos, and the unincorporated uh, northern or southern part of our county. I'm concerned about crime trends going up, and, and I don't think that uh, now is the time to experiment with, uh, you know, those kinds of programs. Well, it's just uh, I, I do think that um, I suggest that there probably are some people, and I, I, and I think I, you know, I, I just don't see that sitting in jail watching television is uh, is necessarily the greatest thing option for them, and going to Alameda County where the prisoners are somewhat more sophisticated uh, than ours, uh, unless you've got a, you know, some kind of a program that you're going to, I guess. Um, take a look at who goes to Alameda County and make sure that they are of the same level of sophistication. But, you know, it just seems to me that um, at least one, uh, my experience with electronic home monitoring where you actually can control the home environment, you know, it's, I understand wanting to keep people in you know, custody for some period of time before they, um, well, they you necessarily want them to detox, but if they stay, for example, at least 30 days in your facility and then you were you know you have some op if you had a really kind of a, a robust program you could actually check the with the living quarters and make sure that they actually are appropriate it, it seems to me that that's a better option than sending them to Alameda County but you know we don't have, have to argue about it it's just that you know maybe we talk to the courts and ask them to see if they're willing to increase their use of that as a intermediate sanction we fundamentally disagree yeah, no, um, uh, I, I, again, I, part of our strategic implementation plan, which is taking a look at our whole system uh, from the day someone steps into the jail to the day that they are released, uh, one important component of that will be uh, expanded use of electronic monitoring. But where we think that it is going to be helpful is letting people out either to go to work or to treatment or to education or to um, vocational training, that type of, of setting where they're out doing something positive, they're out you know, staying engaged in the uh, social and economic fabric of the community, but then still getting that structure that, that many of these people need. Now, we already, there's, there's hundreds of people who, are, um, who get what we call uh, modified sentences that the judge determines, okay, you do need 30 days in jail, you do need 60 days in jail, and when there is an appropriate way to get them back, either to home, to a, a community bed, uh, we're doing that, and we're doing that in an accelerated rate. So there's a lot already going on where people aren't serving the entire sentence. They're going in for 30 days, 60 days. Once they are detoxed, once they are um, uh, ready to change, they're being transitioned out of custody that's one uh, big piece. And then 
Um, you know, the low level offenders that I think, you know, you're envisioning that would be appropriate for this type of program, for the most part, they're already out. I mean, the, you know, the 400 people in the Sheriff's Work Program are people who, you know, in other counties would be doing their time in custody. That's why over 50% of our sentenced inmates are doing their time outside of jail. So the low hanging fruit that might be appropriate for this type of program isn't there. The folks that we're left with uh, in both facilities are people who pretty much need some sort of jail time in order to either protect the public, ensure they don't reoffend, uh, and or uh, get them to that point where they are ready to embrace programs and ready to change. As I say, we fundamentally disagree. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Are there further questions or comments? This is a quick question. Sorry, go ahead. Just a quick question, Sheriff. I know you said <clears throat> that you probably wouldn't have to use it, but in the event that you did have to use uh, the Alameda County plan, how how would you decide who goes? And, and great question, and I think uh, Supervisor Horsley touched on it. So we would look at the individual. We would look at the uh, you know appropriate type of housing. Uh, we would look and talk to Alameda County regarding. Uh, the programs that they have available, we would certainly seek uh, people that would benefit from uh, programs that they might have. Uh, they, they have some pretty innovative uh, programs in their women's uh, population, so uh, we'd be looking for that. We'd also look at where does a person live. Uh, many of our inmates don't live in San Mateo County. If we had inmates that uh, live in Alameda County, that would uh, certainly be a plus if they could be closer to their families. So um, we would uh, make sure that it was the appropriate type of individual going into the appropriate type of housing. So, but generally speaking, we'd be looking for a longer term uh, sentence people or people that aren't, don't have recurring court cases and, and or medical issues uh, to make it uh, as, um, you know, appropriate as we could. Thank you. I, I'd just like to say I, I do think it's a good idea to have a contingency plan because I think the concern I have, the new jail is supposed to be up and running probably mid next year, hopefully. Late next year. Late next year. <laughs> it keeps pushing off. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the concern I have, there, we're projecting an El Nino next year. Let's hope we do get some rain next year. But I really would hate to see us throw good money after bad. I mean, to try to continue to fix up the women's facility, I mean, it is falling apart day by day, mm -hmm. uh, that I think if we don't have a contingency plan, we'd we'd be making a very big mistake. And I think, you know, I've seen the work that you guys have done over there, but I do think at some point, we're not gonna be able to continue to house people if we do have the rains and we do have uh, other things falling apart. Um, and it's unfortunate we have to go outside of the county, but at the same time, I know that uh, you, you'll take a look at those that are going and you know, where they fit or where they don't fit. Um, so I think it's, it's a very wise move to have this contingency plan. So um, I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move it. Uh, we have a motion and a second. I, I just have one, one further comment to make. Um, I'm going to support the motion, and I think the um, uh, you provide us a lot of good information. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, we defer to you to implement it when you think when they think it's needed. Um, and, and just uh, uh, on the issue of electronic, uh, you know, monitoring, I, I I do appreciate, of course, that the judiciary and and uh, your you know your office uh, you know make those decisions and um, and. Uh, I think this inter interchange actually was very very helpful, um, but I, I just wanted to uh, uh, state again publicly my, my support of you know looking harder at EM, particularly for the women, particularly women with children. But uh, that's I guess for another day. So we have a motion and a second. Um, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So second part of this is a report back on uh, jail overcrowding, and for that I'm going to ask the Assistant Sheriff Tom Gallagher to come up and. Good morning. Uh, make sure I use this remote correctly. I uh, just want to report back. I guess there was uh, questions previously about jail overcrowding, some of which Sheriff Monks just uh, touched on and probably answered some of these questions. But the um, core part of it was uh, update on parolees as well. So I'll move through this a little bit. Uh, the jail population, as uh, Sheriff Monks touched on, actually today the jail's population is 9-11. And uh, so we're still well over rated capacity of what's going on in the facility. Again, the women's jail today is at 130. 
Uh, we did uh, recently have to move a group out, and uh, you know we feel the same way as far as not putting a bunch of money into that facility. But it, it also comes down to some quality of life issues for the the women there, and you can only you know clean the carpet so many times before we have to replace it for them just for some quality of life issues. So we were fortunate to use the uh, the uh, overflow housing at uh, McGuire to accomplish that. Uh, realignment, uh, again, we, you know, we're still realizing the changes in how our population goes with realignment. Uh, the, the average stay has actually, uh, um, population is, average length of stay is 170 days. And then I'll show you on this next slide here, it's a little better. The um, 661 of the PRCS inmates have served 21,000 days, average length of stay 33 days. Now what we're doing now, uh, we just started with our new JMS system, is breaking down the flash incarcerations because one of the discussions we had with, um, with uh, the district attorney's offices they seem to have been, they, know, they thought people were staying in there longer on some of these sentences. Well, the flash incarceration, if they're only in for five to seven days, are skewing the numbers a bit. So hopefully in the next six months or so, we'll be able to better uh, assess that as well. So parole violations. As you know, the um, courts now actually oversee the parole violations and, and determine the amount of time that somebody's going to stay in. A few things have happened since realignment. One, the number of parolees in our area has decreased because people aren't being sentenced to parole. They're part of the probation uh, realignment population. Um, and the Superior Court can sentence up to 180 days. Prior to that, uh, I'll be frank, I'm not sure how long the longest uh, sentence was determined by the board, but I never really saw more than six months uh, for a parole violation. This one's actually kind of interesting, though, that although the, you know, we knew the parole population was going to go down because of uh, realignment, uh, what has actually happened, though, is the length of stay has gone up a little bit. So the judges for parole violations are giving a little bit longer sentence on parole violations than actually the, uh, the parole board had given in the past. And again, I don't know if that has anything to do with the type of crimes that people are now on parole because we have uh, those others are now sentenced to realignment that previously had been uh, uh, on parole. So there is a decrease in the parole population. We attribute that to the realignment type population and the way that they're being sentenced. And there has been a slight uh, increase in the amount of time that the lesser group of parolees are staying. Um, if you have any questions on uh, this subject, but I was going to add uh, one thing as far as the population in uh, McGuire and how some of the things uh, fluctuate as far as uh, capacity. So any questions on this part? I, I just want to add on, on McGuire, one thing that, w that we um, tend to forget, the maximum capacity, as Sheriff mentioned, is right around 1,100. But the way, the way that it changes uh, has to do with a lot of the uh, type of inmate that we have in custody now and their sophistication level. What we're seeing now is a lot more of inmates that need to be housed alone. So as an example, if we had a, and all of you have been into McGuire, so if there was a, a bank of housing of 20 rooms with an occupancy for 40 people, uh, well, now if there's 20 house loans, that decreases by 20. And that's happening on a, pretty much on an everyday basis. And again, that's happening because of the sophistication level uh, increase in gang members that we have in custody and different special housing. So it's fluctuating and we're trying to continue to do the juggle. So that concludes my report. If there's any other questions. I, I just had one about the parole revocations, just sure. to make sure I understand. So it, it, if an inmate is incarcerated in, in a, a state prison, potentially for some very serious offense, and then, and then eventually they are paroled, it, those folks are our responsibility now also, right? It's not just the non-non-nons, the lower level offenders. The Am I correct in that? In, in, when any parolee from state prison it basically is transferred to the county in the event of a uh, revocation? We st the parole still oversees some of the uh, parolees that are out there. For, for the housing, if they get shipped down for housing. Is it? I was thinking once they're released from state prison, right, 
and, it, and, and they may have been there for a while because they had a serious offense right. and a lengthy sentence. So then they're being monitored. I, 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 it sounds like maybe by still state parole. State parole still has a uh, parole agent program where they'll monitor their state inmates that are assigned to their caseload. But we do get people that their parole will get revocated. We will house them now. Okay, they so won't. They won't return yeah, to so state in my prison. Little hypothetical there. That you know that person who's committed a more serious crime. Right. They were in jail for six years, say. Right. And they're out. State parole is overlooking them. They do violate parole. Then they get incarcerated in our jail. That's correct. Okay. And and the determination for time is now made by the superior court. It used to be a parole board would determine how much time they would get for their violation. So, so that may bring, you know, some harder, harder criminal, you know, people with more, again, serious track records into our jails that we hadn't seen in the past. Absolutely. What we're seeing on some of those violations, though, is they have an additional on-view charge uh, anyway that was going to bring them back yeah. into custody. And typically the on-view charge uh, significantly outweighs any type of parole violation that I they see. would be getting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Excellent report. Thank you. I just have a question. Maybe it'd be helpful for us to hear a little bit about, and might not be in your uh, bailiwick, but um, about SB 1022, sort of the status of that, the monies that we're getting, and what the time frame is. Okay. I didn't want Bob to sit there too long without something to do. Sure. Good morning, um, President Pine, members of the board, uh, Ms. Farrellis, and Mr. Byers. I'm Bob Livengood, a legislative analyst for the county, and one of my duties is to help oversee the SB 1022 project. Uh, we are, as an update, Supervisor, we are um, going before the State Public Works Board to get authorized as a project here in the next 90 days. Once that happens, then we will at simultaneously begin to search for a uh, architectural and engineer services contract, which we're in the process of preparing an RFQ for right now. We have submitted a number of documents yeah. to the State Public Works Board and to the Department of Finance and to BSCC, a long list of requirements that they have for a state project, which of course this is. And so we've accomplished most of those um, documents and sent them in already. And we, again, this will all lead to a uh, approval by the State Public Works Board for our project. That's when we begin actually in earnest to um, move the project forward. The timing is that we should, uh, we've timed it so that we will not begin construction until the, the Maple Street Correctional Center is open. So if we do have to move inmates, hopefully we will have room for them in the new facility. Um, we anticipate to begin construction on the project in about two years. Uh, it will be a, uh, a sequencing of projects. As you know, the, there's four separate projects within McGuire. What that sequence will be yet, we don't know. So we don't know exactly when we will need to relieve the old McGuire pod of its inmates. The sheriff mentioned there's a possibility they will actually have to shut old McGuire down during construction, depending on whether we can keep that facility completely secure while we are rehabbing one of the floors. So that gives you kind of a basic of, uh, of where we are. Um, we are ahead of almost every county in terms of moving these projects forward, and we intend to do it as quickly as possible because in this environment, time is money. And the longer it takes to prepare and to construct, the more money this will cost. So we're moving forward as quickly as we can. Thanks, Bob. You bet. Appreciate that. Okay. I think we've uh, completed that item. Thank you uh, again for uh, your comments. And this would be a good time to take a, a short break. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, we are uh, back here in session. We now have uh, two director's reports, which is part of the series of director reports we've been having. And the first is from the Department of Housing, Mr. O Mr. Lowell. Good morning, President Pine, members of the board, Ms. Perales and Mr. Byers. Thank you very much for this opportunity to update you on the Department of Housing midway through our two-year cycle. Um, Happy New Year. All right, that was a local government nerd joke. Today is the first day <laughs> of the year for us. We did have a party last night back in the department. Um, I thought you might appreciate a break. Uh, our mission remains unchanged. The Department of Housing is a catalyst for increasing access to affordable housing, increasing the supply of workforce housing, and supporting related community development so that housing permanently exists for people of all income levels and generations in San Mateo County. We have a couple of uh, headline measures uh, this year. And this first one, as you know, the, the housing department, the main two divisions are housing community development, HCD, and the housing authority. And this first one refers to the HCD side of the house. Uh, federal funds come with a lot of rules and regulations, and uh, the community development block grant must be spent in a, actually a very short period of time. Uh, otherwise, we are open to recapture by the federal government. So we had a problem a couple of years ago, and we actually missed the target and had an uh, action plan with HUD to, to fix that. Um, last year, we met our target, and this year, we will certainly meet our target and, and forevermore going forward. But it does put a, a community into jeopardy of, of uh, losing some of those funds. So that's, that's a very important nationwide benchmark. On the Housing Authority side, uh, one of the important benchmark is uh, with the voucher program itself, the, uh, the big program in the Housing Authority. And HUD uh, requests that 98% of vouchers or the money that is there for vouchers, for voucher funding, be spent each year. Um, but you may not spend more than 100%. So it is very, uh, sometimes I feel like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, you know, pulling switches and turning wheels and so on, trying to start, stop, start, stop, to keep between 98 and 100. It's very, very difficult. We, we managed to do that. Um, one of the things I would highlight here is on the right-hand side, you can see the number of households actually being uh, helped with vouchers. Um, it's down slightly. Last year was especially difficult for us because, last uh, calendar year, because there was no federal budget, because of all the arguing about what kind of Armageddon we were going to face on the federal side, um, and then sequestration, where we, the voucher budget is about $60 million, and we lost $3.6 million through sequestration. We, along with all the housing authorities, stopped issuing vouchers at one point because we didn't didn't know what was happening, didn't have the money. And we are now issuing vouchers as quickly as we can because the money was restored this calendar year. But our voucher outstandings at the moment are actually down about to about 95%. So we're working very, very hard to restore that. Also, as a reminder, we lost about 280,000 in administrative funds through sequestration and 200,000 in CDBG and home funds. This next one is a, a new one for us, but it's something that we watch very carefully in the, in the department and wanted to share it with you, run it by you. This is uh, on the, on the uh, development side. It is the amount, uh, it's a leverage ratio showing the, how much each local dollar invested in new affordable housing is leveraging dollars from other sources. And so there isn't a nationwide standard, but it is our efficiency measure because we try to make this as high as possible. We're the early money. The developers come to us. They are our partners. We, we appreciate them and get along well, but there is a tension in that they would like as much money as possible. They'd like us to you know, put all of the money on their project. There's not enough money to go around, so we uh, work with them to find other sources and to, to maximize the, the leveraging of, of that money as much as possible. Um, quite good last year, 15 to 1. Actually, I think that'll end up being higher this year. Um, and our target is 15 to 1. And the actual numbers you can just see on the right-hand side. So it is, it is pretty remarkable. The local money, as I say, is the more flexible money, the early-in money. <clears throat> and in 
6.6 million, <coughs> excuse me, of local money leveraging 99 million towards projects that open, actually opened during the year. Okay. Um, our other HCD programs focus on first time home buyers programs, uh, minor home repair, more substantial re uh, rehab programs, and this is tracking that. Last year we had quite a good year, um, and this year actually the, the at, after the end of the year, I expect the numbers will even be higher. We, most of these numbers are coming from the minor home repair program. Um, and that is something that we do, uh, I, I believe it is a very efficient because we do it with our partners in the community. We contract, um, as you know from, from our uh, spring NOFA, with uh, four uh, nonprofits in the community. That's um, CID, Center for Independence of, of the Disabled, with El Concilio, with Rebuilding Together, and with uh, senior co-siders. And those four, in turn, take that about 350000 a year and put it towards minor home repair. Those repairs are so important to helping people stay in place. The focus is on safety, accessibility, and emergency repairs. Typical repairs, um, grab bars, uh, ADA-style ramps, and so on. Uh, Per household, only a thousand or two, sometimes less than a thousand, sometimes up to as much as three or four thousand, highly efficient, then a family can stay safely in their home for the future. And this, uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit about the provider based program. It is a unique program to San Mateo County because of the MTW status of our housing authority. Um, it started a couple of years ago with your support, and this is where we take. Uh, some of our voucher program and contract with uh, agencies in the county who are supporting populations that are extremely hard to reach by the regular Section 8 program and who may only need help for a short period of time. In effect, what we're doing with these agencies is setting up little smaller housing agencies. It started with uh, three houses of the Service League uh, in their reentry program and 16 units at Cora for apartments for folks who are coming out of shelter who would otherwise be homeless. And uh, last year we added three houses of HIP um, housing that are, that are focused on uh, family self-sufficiency. And they're shared houses. It's actually 18 rooms. And Service League increased from three to five houses. So, and there's growth there. There's a little over 60 slots available overall. Service League, so a couple of the, the new ones are just coming online. And here, final, final slide, uh, final measure, uh, also an efficiency measure of the number of families um, who are exiting our housing subsidy programs as a result of self-sufficiency. So I think this is the one to watch for the future. We'll put our, our name on the line here. Um, this is, as you know, you've approved, we're moving more and more into a time-limited uh, voucher program, of a five-year program. And so this number will be increasing rapidly, which will allow us to help more people since the number of vouchers is limited. Um, what you have here so far is been in the 40s. This number will be increasing, should be increasing rather more rapidly in the years to come. And on the right-hand side is just, there were 44 in this category last year. And the right-hand side is trying to show what happened with those folks, the largest group um, well, let me start at the top, the, the green zero housing subsidy. What that means is when a family reaches a certain level of income, they're no longer able to use the voucher. Uh, so it, it's a good thing. And after they no longer use the voucher for a few months, they then lose the voucher. They're independent and have income to support themselves. The orange part is there are people graduating from our time-limited program, and we follow them very closely. And we know where they're, they're either staying in place or moving, and we know where they're moving to. So they're not moving to a shelter because they've lost their voucher. They're in permanent housing. And then the two are um, same category that I just spoke of, but they also receive escrow amounts, which can be in the thousands of dollars. Those are amounts that families, participants can earn through self-sufficiency activities, successful completion of them, education or increasing credit scores, things like that. Um, and they are successfully for a significant period of time off of any form of public assistance. 
our budget summary. Um, it's not too much to say there. I would note that uh, the next year does include 500,000 of Measure A funds that were recently allocated for the agricultural workforce housing program to come. And then some highlights. Uh, here we are in the, the middle of our two-year budget cycle. And uh, after this, as this, at this midpoint, uh, I think one of the stars has to be the Affordable Housing Fund. Thanks to your board and the allocation of the uh, $13.4 million, uh, we were able to fund the six affordable housing projects um, with over 325 units. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also the renovation and or expansion of our three uh, year-round shelters, uh, which renovated or has the potential to also create 330 shelter beds. So that's both renovate, that's combined. And the 15 units at Family Crossroads, um, which was purchased by Envision as a result of this action and is gonna be undergoing a substantial renovation. So that's a terrific resource <coughs> for, for this. So this was just a huge success. Um, it's fair to say that these either would not be happening or they would be delayed by a year or two or three without the Affordable Housing Fund. The first, number one and three, um, actually received their tax credit allocation in the March round, <clears throat> excuse me, and what made them so competitive was the amount of local funds. So that puts them at a competitive advantage in the um, competition. So both the uh, Willow Housing, and uh, which I'll talk more about in a second, and the Foster Square Senior Housing in Foster City, um, both receive their tax credits and are both going to break ground before the end of the year. A couple more highlights. A big highlight on the coast has been, uh, as you know, Half Moon Village was 60 units of affordable senior housing owned and operated by the Housing Authority. Built in the 60s, it needed to be replaced. And as a result of a number of years of effort on the part of the department and many partners on the board and, and the city, and nonprofits, um, we were able to put together a campus plan, um, one part of which was the new Half Moon Village, so it's gone from 60 to 160 units. Phase one, which is in the picture, just opened, and phase two, it opened at the beginning of the year. Phase two is under construction now and will open in about a year. Um, also part of the campus plan was the Coastside Senior Community. Um, this was on the front parcel on Main Street. Um, finally, uh, the new senior uh, center in, in Half Moon Bay is opened on the, it was constructed as a result of this and is open on the first floor, as is the new Adult Day Health Center. And up above it, 40 units of affordable senior housing. Um, so led by Leslie Garden, Leslie Senior Communities and, and Mercy Housing. So, and the thing that is so fantastic about this, and it's really uh, received, starting to receive a lot of attention from out of the area, is because it really brings together the services and a community, a walkable community, um, together in one place in, in a way that, that really, really ensures a, a fabulous quality of life for our seniors. So we're very proud of that. Another highlight has been housing for veterans. Um, there was an opportunity that came before all of us uh, a little over a year ago, almost two years ago, from Core Housing, developer, where they had received a lease to build housing on the VA campus in Menlo Park. And the issue was uh, the land was donated, but where was the rest of the money going to come from? The typical issue. And we really did some uh, head scratching in the beginning. Um, we've not only helped to put all of the money together, including the Affordable Housing Fund, including the department's regular NOFA, um, uh, and, and so, and I would say we also were able to receive 35 additional VASH vouchers from the federal government, which that's the Section 8 vouchers through the VA. And uh, we were probably the first um, in the nation to project base those in a new affordable construction. So we're very proud of that. Uh, Cindy Chan is in charge of our rental programs. She was at a housing conference not long ago, and she was kind of mobbed. Uh, and they, around the state, they're calling it the Cindy Chan model. So I think she's very proud of that as a way to how to project base these vouchers. That, as a result of that, they 
were successful in their tax credit round, and it will start construction at the very end of this year, 60 units for veterans. And one more, we, we've not talked about this, but this is very important. Um, as you know, the waiting list for Section 8 is a, a morass. <laughs> we, we've always done a good job in this county of, of doing it through a lottery so, it, so as to avoid panic or people lining up overnight, but still, it's a ridiculous process. Our last list was created in 2008, and we, only, we did a lottery. We just exhausted it at the beginning of this year. Um, while that was going on, we were able to take advantage of technology and design a new system, uh, again, which I'm proud to say is, is, a, is a going to be a national model. Maybe we'll be able to sell some of this and, and make some money for the county. Um, it is an always open list. Um, it's an interest list, and we had to get a work with a lot of HUD rules um, so that we can basically keep this always open on an interestless basis, and then we do periodic, it could be as often as monthly, draws, of lottery draws. And it's, it's an e-commerce model. Folks sign up uh, on the web. They can come in and help us if they're not at all familiar or don't have access to a computer. We'll do it for them. And that way, also, most of the calls we receive at the front desk is, am I still on the list and where am I on the list? And the first question we can now, they can answer for themselves. They, can, they have an account. They can go on, make sure they're there. They can change their address, their information. They can call us the same. Uh, where they are on the list is, is a trickier question for, for preference reasons, but we can give them much more information. They can look it up themselves. They can change their information on, on the fly. So there is no more, uh, there are no more waiting around the block um, kind of issue for that. And uh, we have, as I mentioned, we, we are issuing vouchers now um, as quickly as we can. So we're reaching folks on that list. They're quite surprised to sign up for the list one day and get a call the next week to come in for an interview. Um, another highlight has been the increase of the uh, time-limited program from 300 to 800 vouchers. And folks who are now being called in for vouchers are entering this program. And this comes with the increased case management services. So folks do have... Uh, a much more extensive plan for their five years with us, and uh, uh, more frequent check-ins and more availability of services. And last, uh, no, two more. One is uh, agricultural workforce housing, and uh, here, you know, there are many long-standing issues, problems, and challenges on the coast. And the whole nature of uh, housing for our farm workers has changed over the years. I'm on a rapid learning curve about this. I won't pretend to be an expert. But uh, with the help of Supervisor Horsley's office and other partners, we are embarking um, as soon as possible in the next uh, month or so on a study of existing conditions, needs, and opportunities. And there are also a couple things, opportunities that have surfaced more immediately, some rehabilitation needs and so on that we can just start working on immediately. So um, that is going on. And then last but not least, uh, 21 Elements you've heard about over the years. This has been a big success for the county. Um, county leadership has been instrumental in the creation and uh, care and feeding of this program. Um, and this year, a few months ago, it was awarded, uh, received an award from the American Planning Association. Um, the California chapter gave, gave the uh, award of excellence um, in best practices category for this. And there was a, a dinner for that. Um, the 21 elements, just to remind folks, the, uh, it does, it's a way that all 21 jurisdictions in the county, including the county itself, come together with the aid of a consultant to plan our housing elements. And as we, this is now, we're on the second round of this. All housing elements are due again for our county early next year. And the county has, uh, all of its jurisdictions have submitted and approved housing elements, which is unusual in the state. And that will certainly happen again next year. It's very efficient um, because a lot of the information that we use is the same. So to have a consultant helping us. The uh, CCAG has been a tremendous partner in this, uh, pays for a good deal of it. The cities and county pay for uh, a subscription, and the Department of Housing pays for part of it. And I will leave you with what we're looking at uh, over the horizon a little bit. Um, we are preparing um, our Affordable Housing Fund Part 2. 
That is the housing authority uh, has been able to put together $5 million that we are now, we will be back to the board uh, in August with a plan for that and asking for your input. Um, and we'll issue a NOFA as soon as possible thereafter um, to try and push a couple more of our affordable housing, uh, uh, excuse me, multifamily projects across the finish line and other, meet other needs as well. So that's been a great thing. A lot of that came from the great partnership around Half Moon Bay. Originally, the, count, the housing authority was putting 4.4 million into the redevelopment of Half Moon Village. The financing ultimately for that, and the, the enormous price that they received for the tax credits, investment of the tax credits, resulted in the fact that at, at the end of the day, they'll only need 1.1 million. So we're recycling 3 million and added, we're able to add two more to that. So more to come on that. Um, I didn't put on here anything about the federal government. I didn't want to depress you. Um, it's sort of, is, there is no good news and it seems to get worse. So however, I put on the state, which seems to be, have been uh, slightly resuscitated from, from the depths of the uh, recession. And there are a few new state sources of funding which we are uh, very, you know, total watching and planning and, and doing everything we can to make sure that uh, some of that comes to San Mateo County. There was a passage by the voters last month of the $600 million bond issue for veterans housing. Um, there is a cap and trade money for the first time. Well, that money is just starting. And $135 million was allocated statewide for affordable housing development. And the agreement going forward was that 10% of the cap and trade funds will go towards a transit-oriented affordable housing um, with the idea that you know, it needs to reduce greenhouse gases. So uh, I think some of our rural communities might be disappointed, but it's, it the transit-oriented part is extremely important. And that, the, the projection that could grow to three to $500 million a year. So it's sort of the first permanent source of affordable housing development money from the state uh, on an ongoing basis. And then the multi uh, family housing program received $100 million. That hasn't been funded by the state for several years, so that's a great thing. So we're watching all those and hoping for more. Uh, we'll be continuing to work on the agricultural workforce plans and whatever we can do in, in, uh, in that sector. Um, and one that I haven't mentioned so far is aging in place. We've talked a lot about it um, as a community for years, and we have two concrete examples uh, of uh, progress in that area. The first is this is working with our health department and especially with the health plan of San Mateo. Uh, they are providing money and resources to our new senior projects so that uh, some of the apartments there are uh, going to be used by the frail elderly. And these are folks who would be, would work with the health plan in terms of placement, folks who would have been in assisted living, if not skilled nursing, and who can now remain in place uh, with all this additional support that the health plan's uh, giving. So it's a better quality of life, saves the health plan money versus skilled nursing. And we like it because there are folks who we know can't live 100% independently, but that doesn't mean they need to be in skilled nursing. So it's a terrific thing. It's being expanded in the Foster Square uh, senior development in Foster City, and there'll be more units there. So very exciting, and it comes from uh, the flexibility and um, creativity of the health plan to, to help us. And the last one uh, is that we, the HCD side administers over 400 loans and many, many other assets, and it's kind of paper-based. <laughs> so uh, while the uh, Housing Authority has automated uh, all of its operations, the HCD side is now uh, trying to do the same, and that's a really big initiative for that side of the house to um, these assets sometimes are on the books for 55 years, and um, so we need to have a very organized way of, of collecting loans and tracking our assets and hope to make a lot of progress there. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Very uh, thorough presentation. Do we have uh, questions? Any questions from the board? No, just a, a quick comment that I really appreciate uh, working with uh, Bill on, um, on um, farm labor housing, and we do have a couple of uh, projects that are on post and mid-pen uh, property, and maybe even one 
uh, private landowner as well. But I think he didn't give himself enough credit for that, the Half Moon Bay Village and senior campus. It was Janet Stone, Bill, of course, Bill Lowell, Dwayne Bay, and my predecessor, Rich Gordon, actually came up with um, sort of a land swap uh, but the, that the board approved. It's really, it's really a remarkable facility. Uh, it's high quality for low-income seniors. And you know, I did get, get a chance to, on their grand opening, take a look at go into some of the units and the people are so happy and so proud. So congratulations, really a, a, a fine project. Great. Uh, we do have one speaker, Mr. Uh, Marty Fox. Thank you again, President Pine, members of the board, Ms. Ferales and Mr. Byers. Uh, I thank the board for their help in the Veterans Housing Project that was mentioned during the presentation. <clears throat> However, housing is not treatment. And uh, getting people into treatment should be a gr of greater priority. There are, will be 100,000 fewer female and male soldiers on active duty before the end of the year af as Afghanistan winds down. The Department of Veterans Affairs scheduling scandal clearly shows that the that it is not ready for the return of treatment resistant, treatment non-compliant female and male service members who were trained to be violent like me. The United States Department of Justice approved assisted outpatient treatment in wars law as an effective, efficient, and humane hospitalization and incarceration recidivism reduction program in March of 2012. The health system continues to throw money down mental health wellness rat holes, which rely on the brutality of the streets to modify the behavior of persons living with serious mental illness who are insight deficient. This can be deadly, as we have seen in Pacifica on March 18th, and again in Half Moon Bay on June 3rd. Please vote to implement Laura's law and don't leave our veterans to suffer and die on the streets while we have the opportunity to care for those who have unselfishly served our nation and need our help now. Thank you. I believe we've uh, con concluded the discussion on the Department of Housing, so we'll now turn to uh, the Human Service Agency and Child Department of Child Support Services. Good morning, President Pine, honorable members of the board, Mrs. Barales, Mr. Byers, I'm Eliana Rodriguez with the Human Services Agency and Department of Child Support Services. And it is my pleasure to present to you today the performance report for the departments. The mission for the Human Services Agency is to assist individuals and families to achieve economic self-sufficiency and, and promote community and family strength and work to ensure the child's safety and well-being of everyone. The Department of Child Support Services is to enhance the well-being of children by collecting the support to which they're entitled to. We'll go over some key headline measures for the department. The first is in the area of economic self-sufficiency. The uh, indicator here is the timeliness for processing of applications across the four applications. The benchmark is 90%. And as you can see, uh, historically, we've had some issues meeting the benchmark. Uh, last year, we the, some uh, changes were done and process flows adjusted, which helped us uh, achieve the 94 percentile in CalWORKS, general assistance, and I believe in, in about 92% in the CalFresh area. While we were uh, late last year uh, meeting the 90% per percentile in the Medi-Cal area with the implementation of the National Affordable Care Act, uh, we've had some difficulties and it has dropped. Uh, it's reflecting 50%. I think we're tracking uh, a little lower than that. The system, the CalHERE system, which is the eligibility system for the state of California, uh, Department of Healthcare Services, has created a bottleneck. Uh, in the past, where we would approve eligibility locally in our local county systems, 
it would come back uh, almost instantaneously. That's no longer the case. Since ACA, we have to uh, take the application. People will come in through what is called the CalHear system, and it'll either come down to the county or they apply through our portal, and we send it up. That has an enormous delay today where uh, it's supposed to be immediate eligibility. Uh, if we get it back in 10, 20 days, uh, it's surprising. I think less than 30% are being received within that time frame. Last night, there was an emergency uh, meeting, and the state has come up with a system to try to take these cases that are bottlenecked and create them in the med system, which is the state's, when you go to the doctors or go to your pharmacist to get prescriptions, that's a system uh, the network of providers relies on to say, yes, uh, this individual is covered. They're mitigating, they're looking at mitigation of risks. Uh, if they think this is a viable issue, then uh, I think they'll proceed and try to load all those cases electronically. The downside is uh, they are still not known to the county systems. So even if they are successful in implementing that, we have to still uh, upload those cases into our local systems. What I can tell you today is that our staff have worked diligently to touch every case that has come to San Mateo, and I know we had a board memorandum uh, back in March explaining what our efforts would be in April, and we did that. We achieved it. Uh, every case has been processed. There are thousands, uh, upwards of 4,000, waiting for uh, the state system to respond on eligibility. On the upside of all of this, uh, I'm sure Social Security and, and other uh, national endeavors had hiccups. The upside, we have 27,000 more individuals covered in our county, 15,000 on Medi-Cal, and uh, I believe maybe it's actually 27,000, it's 42,000, 27,000 um, through the premium tax credit. So that's an enormous speed. Oops. Wrong button. Here we have a key indicator for our child welfare program, and the benchmark is to reunify children uh, within 12 months back into their homes. 75% uh, is the benchmark. We're lagging a little, but making progress. And what I can tell you is one of the reasons we're lagging, uh, we are one of the few counties who have opted to use um, the interim placement, our, our, um, our receiving home as an assessment center. So we take all children and they are assessed and tried to match uh, properly with uh, foster parents in addition, or um, uh, guardians. In addition, they are assessed for mental health, education, and health issues. That counts as a placement. Uh, we're under the direction of Dr. Noon, we are making adjustments, and I'm confident we're going to reach the 70 percentile while still keeping this best practice. In terms of child support collected, uh, we are consistently exceeding the benchmark of 60 percent. This year, we finished at 67 percent, and we're looking at partnership with the employment uh, unit of Human Services Agency to link uh, fathers unemployed or underemployed with employment services through our contempt calendar. So it's a partnership with HSA uh, and the court system. In terms of some performance measures, here's another one for um, child welfare. San Mateo County has among the lowest caseloads in the state because of best practices. As such, the current case that we have are among the most complex in terms of the range and needs of the children. And by complex, I mean that uh, a decade ago, you would not see teenagers uh, with suicidal tendencies. Today, our social workers are seeing eight-year-olds with suicidal tendencies. 
Our social workers have to work to identify families willing and able to meet the needs of such children, and we work to make sure that there are permanent homes that can provide these children with the security and nurturing uh, and a nurturing environment. We are trending towards meeting the standard of uh, the 24-month placement, uh, and I'm sure we'll get there. In terms of the percentage of welfare-to-work participants, uh, the agency has, it's low, and since the recession uh, ended, it's starting to climb upward as jobs uh, appear and there's opportunities for the workforce. But the agency has a series of action steps in the works to continue our trend to increase our work participation right here. From internal changes to foregoing new external collaborations, our goal is to increase employment opportunities for all our clients. While our rate has been low post-recession, there has been improvement. We have improved to 25% in the month of April. That's a 92% increase from this that time last year. I believe we'll close out this year at about 15%. However, I'm confident that the changes we are instituting are making a difference and will continue with this upward trajectory. In addition, the agency later this summer will advertise an RFP to connect our clients to regional employers, focusing on our northern and southern borders of our county to complement the central services. We think we'll be able to engage more of our client population in work activities. With regards to the uh, percent of residents receiving CalFresh benefits, we have increased uh, and made significant strides in this area. I'm proud to share with the board that our data is continuing to show we are heading in the right direction, have made significant gains. We've increased, that shows a 6%, 7% increase. It's actually 7,800 families and individuals more we've connected with in this last year. That's a 28% uh, jump. Our CalFresh team has done a magnificent job of getting the word out. We've hosted or participated in over 18 community engagement events, and we even collaborated with Skyline College on CalFresh in a day, where we were able to determine eligibility and provide EBT cards to individuals that same day. We will continue this effort this uh, coming years. With the implementation of ACA, we also received uh, cross uh, program eligibility. It means if you're on Medi-Cal or CalWORKS, you can opt in to CalFresh. You're categorically eligible. So we think that this number will continue the upward trend. The good news, though, is that with the governor's budget, they've adjusted the gross income test from 138% to 200% of federal poverty level. And that's great news for our county. What it means for a family of three where the income test used to be $2,100, it's going up to $3,255 per month. Performance measure for child support are those cases with back support due who are making a payment on it. And you'll see we the benchmark is 65% and we are exceeding uh, the target. In terms of a budget summary, uh, not much to comment here. It's uh, pretty much a status quo budget. The adjustments, about $2 million more uh, in human services, and that's to account for the 3% COLA. And there's a slight reduction in uh, full-time staff. That's due to the temporary ACA employees we had on board for open enrollment. And the Department of Child Support Services is pretty much status quo. So highlights for this year, uh, again, the 42,000 residents enrolled in ACA, and hopefully we'll get the word out again later this year and have even more individuals covered. We implemented three mobile applications in both uh, departments. You have the DCSS mobile uh, application and the CalWIN in addition to the Code for America. So we're putting services and information at the fingertips 
of our clients. AB 12 uh, extended uh, benefits and services to our foster care youth 18 to 21 years of age in terms of supportive independent living similar to the South San Francisco uh, project where we have I believe 12 or 15 foster youth housed. I want to thank Bill Lowell and his staff. Uh, when they found out about it, they stepped up and provided housing vouchers for these foster care youths. Uh, there's employment and training and education available to them. In addition to that, ACA increased uh, health insurance coverage for them up to age 26, which is huge. Uh, and this is a very vulnerable population. 40% of those foster youth who emancipate out of the system uh, are homeless within 18 months. It's huge. 70% uh, of those incarcerated individuals have some for, form of uh, former foster care, uh, had been in, our, in the systems. In terms of priorities uh, next year, obviously walking around the mall uh, a while back, uh, our former president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, put it best. Uh, employment, uh, or lack thereof, is a menace to our social order. This agency will be focused on uh, increasing opportunities for our clients and increasing our work participation rate. As I mentioned, the RFP to expand employment services in the North and South will facilitate employment participation for our residents. They don't have to travel to Central County, ideally. You can go, whether it's in South City or Daly City, whoever bids on it, uh, there's going to be something more local to you, more accessible to transportation. We also have, uh, with the assistance of this board, uh, we've got the Achieve 180 and the AB 109 population and the Unified Reentry Program at Service Connect, which uh, I believe will be a model uh, in future years. Uh, we now have probation and behavioral health all located uh, in one uh, spot. And shortly, I hope nonprofits will join us. We know Star Vista is chomping at the bits to join in and some of our other partners. Family stabilization. Many times individuals do not participate in employment programs because there are other things in their families going on. New legislation in this state is going to allow us to address those issues. It's no longer focused on that one individual receiving the grant, but perhaps there are mental health issues, uh, housing, homelessness, the services and the money is now available for us to do more wraparound services with these individuals. So the, there is pretty much no limitation in terms of addressing uh, what issue a family may have, uh, and the money was allocated in the governor's budget. So this is great news. And we'll be partnering, we'll be also putting out another RFP this summer to partner with our community-based organizations to provide some of these services. Putting data to work. The agency understands how precious our tax dollars are and how we must make the very best use of our resources. We are using data throughout the agency to drive us towards smarter decisions. One example is using the census track data you see here, an outline of our county, and we're thinking, who isn't yet participating in our CalFresh enrollment? The darker the red, the higher uh, the percentage of individuals not participating. We overlaid that with school district information, and then we're able to see what schools are in that area so we can partner with the Office of Education uh, to get the word out to families who are on the free lunch meal and may not be on the Cal Fresh uh, caseload. Transforming the delivery of services. We've got some antiquated technology sometimes and kind of clunky technology at the department I've seen this last six months. Um, we need to overhaul them. We also need to uh, redesign the way we're providing some of our services. We've tended to overlay processes, and we need to look at those processes and streamline them and free up the worker's time to really do that face-to-face -face engagement that takes more time. But that back um, office stuff 
uh, that we can move off of their workloads, we should. And we'll be looking to do that. Our call center redesign. We need to re-engineer the call center at the agency. Um, I would describe it more in terms of case doing eligibility on the phone, which is clogging up the system. You can't put enough caseworkers on the phone to do eligibility. It's a process that takes face-to-face -face an hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half. Um, that's not a way to conduct a call center. So you'll be looking, we'll, you'll watch us redesign the center in the next year or two so that we can bring down those wait times uh, and create some efficiencies. Continuous process improvement. Quality is never an ending quest, and continuous process improvement is never ending. It's a never ending uh, effort of discovery to eliminate and, main, and identify main causes uh, of problems. You accomplish this through small steps, not uh, grandiose uh, redesigns, and rather than, in, rather than implementing one huge uh, reorganization. I think we've done some of that in the past that has uh, come back to haunt us in some degrees. So continuous improvement is critical to our internal and external uh, customers. I've been with the agency for six months and I see our frontline workers working very hard. Uh, in some instances, harder than it should be. Uh, that needs to change. It appears to me that we have created many workarounds and instituted processes to resolve an issue. We've been reactive and not proactive. Uh, that needs to change. CPI means making things better. Uh, it's not about fighting fires. Its goal is not to blame people or workers, uh, but to identify the issues and correct them. It's a problem-solving approach, and we've started doing some of that with the engagement of our frontline workers. Uh, I recall by being a caseworker, many times they know better than anybody else what's going on and how you can fix this. So uh, we're engaging our frontline workers and from top to bottom to re-engineer some processes. That's the year in review. Um, I wanna thank the board and the county manager's office for their continued support. I also want to thank my staff for all they do and our frontline staff, uh, especially that ACA team who has been embattled for uh, almost a year now. And unfortunately, uh, hopefully the state figures this out before we do open enrollment again. But thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions from the board? I just, I just want to make a comment. I mean, You've done a, a tremendous amount of heavy lifting. You not only are ta tackling HSA, but continue to tackle child support services. And I have to tell you, as you mentioned, it's not to overhaul everything in a day. You've just made steady progress. And I think over time, we're going to see uh, the benefits of, of that uh, direction that you're taking uh, with HSA and with child support services. So I really thank you. It's only been six months, and there's a lot of work going on, and mm -hmm. staff's doing a great job. They're really trying to you know, change the process. And as you say, efficiency is what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well. And I really appreciate your, uh, your, your use of data and willingness to really dig into that as we go forward. Thank you. County Manager Report. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the board. Just a few updates and announcements this morning. Um, we want to make you aware that we have a work group that is being coordinated by Deputy County Manager Mike Callagy around uh, bringing together the Sheriff's Office and Behavioral Health uh, to form a joint response uh, by police and a mental health clinician uh, where there are incidents um, of subjects suffering from mental illness. And uh, this is one of the um, initiatives that we're going to put in place after incidents like Half Moon Bay over the last few weeks. On the veterans needs assessment, we have selected applied survey research to do the, um, the needs assessment and the convening. Uh, we have a save the date out for October 3rd from 8 a.m. to noon to do the convening at the Human Services Agency uh, Harbor Boulevard offices. 
So if you could please save that date and more details to come. On congratulations to our graduates of the Independent Living Program. Uh, these are our foster youth ages 14 to 24. We had 39 youth graduating um, in the last uh, month and 67% of them went on to a two-year and four-year program. So can we congratulate them and thank probation and HSA for uh, their efforts in this area. Uh, thank you to Genentech and our nonprofit Turning Wheels for Kids. We received um, 150 new bicycles, also the South San Francisco Fire Department um, to thank, and the bicycles will go towards the um, children who are identified through HSA program referrals as well as our Children's Fund uh, holiday drive. We also want to congratulate uh, the health system and HSA on Affordable Care Act enrollment. The stats have come in and we were 16th in the state for community-based entities and that included uh, Ravenswood Health Center and a number of our community-based organizations that helped us sign up um, residents for health coverage. We were also number one, as Jean Fraser had noted in on the June 3rd board meeting, we were the number one government entity that signed up residents uh, for health coverage in the state. On North Fair Oaks Forward, under the leadership of Peggy Jensen, we received a grant from Kaiser and this is going to go towards uh, North Fair Oaks Forward to wellness. And this is to do outreach um, around wellness and illegal dumping prevention uh, related to the redesign of Middlefield Road. So we want to thank uh, Peggy, congratulate her team um, for, for the work to get that grant. On performance, we have a number of our dashboards that are up and running. Uh, the departments that have presented to you so far all those department program reports are now online at uh, performance.smcgov.org. Um, we're also working on the Share Vision 2025 dashboard that should be up in the fall. Uh, the Measure A dashboard is live. We're doing another update for the Oversight Committee when it meets uh, in October, on October 23rd at 6 p.m. at the College of San Mateo. And you've seen uh, the demonstration of the sustainability dashboard and we're currently working on the safety net and the process improvement dashboards. We'll show you more of that over the next several months. And then with SMC Saves, uh, this is our second round of SMC Saves. Thank you to uh, the board for your support. Um, these are the grants that we give to departments for coming up with uh, projects. And these are one-time funds uh, around projects to save money uh, by improving performance or generating revenue. The letters of intent were due from departments yesterday. I haven't gotten a count yet, but uh, we had over 20 applicants last year, including the uh, fleet reservation system um, for public works. Uh, we also want to welcome a couple of new staff members to the county manager's office. We have Krista Big, who's our new social media coordinator. She begins on July 28th. Uh, and she'll be working for Marshall Wilson in our office. And we also want to welcome Matthew Chidester from Real Property. He will be joining us as one of our budget policy and performance analysts in August. Many of you have probably worked with Matthew uh, around real property issues, so we want to welcome um, Matthew. And on HSA, they just started their Twitter account. If you haven't followed them already, they're at SMCHSA. And they also launched their Facebook page this last month. San Mateo County Civics 101. So Marshall Wilson is uh, planning to bring that back to the county. And this is a free course that uh, is for our residents, gives them a firsthand look of uh, uh, our county programs. They'll be starting in the fall um, and uh, look for additional information over the next several months on that. And then last, we just updated our emergency plan for the Redwood City Government Center campus after we had the power outage on April 14th. Um, a number of our departments got together to update that plan. We do have new assembly areas and command posts. We'll get that out to employees over the next uh, several weeks. That's all, thank you. Thank you for the report. Uh, we now move to item 10, which is uh, uh, matter being brought forward by Supervisor Horsley concerning the 
Golden Gate National Rec Recreation Area Dog Draft Draft Dog Management Plan. Well, uh, thank you, President Pine. Uh, this came about because of uh, concerns from uh, a lot of my constituents, as well as um, went to a press conference with the uh, President of the Board of Supervisors for both San Francisco and Marin County, and uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, and uh, we'd all agreed to um, sponsor a, a resolution. Um, requesting some changes with the dog management plan. In any case, because of uh, some last minute uh, language changes or, or last minute concerns over the language in our resolution, which actually, to be honest, is actually much milder than San Francisco's, um, I'm just gonna ask the board to take a stand in, op in opposing the GGNRA's preferred alternative F. And I'm gonna ask the board to agree to send a letter to the GGNRA asking that they adopt a more inclusive and communally acceptable dog management policy, which is essentially the item and item number B, which essentially says the same thing that I just um, uh, said. So um, I, I'll make a motion to that effect. Second. I give a motion and a second. We do have um, two speakers, uh, Ron uh, Makel, if it's Ron, yeah, Ron's here, and followed by Marlene Finley. Good afternoon, uh, name is Ron Mikkel, Pacifica. Yeah, I uh, hear, uh, I'm kind of disappointed in this resolution. I actually have written on the top here, Poor Losers Club, because that's what this is all about. It's Poor Losers, the dog group who, you know, uh, uh, put, uh, you know, did lawsuits against the Park Service and they were very disrupted during the negotiated rulemaking that was taking place, of which I almost participated in. I went to the uh, the introduction to it, but I was too busy. I was a planning commissioner at the time and also a committee member for the Pacific Estuary General Advisory Committee. But, you know, they were very disruptive uh, and, and caused the shutdown of the negotiated rulemaking. These dog people are, are a very angry group of people. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is uh, on uh, whereas number 10, whereas GGRA manages five parks in San Mateo County, Maury Point, Malaga Ridge, Sweeney Ridge, Pedro Point, that is not under the Park Service's management, okay? That is, that along with Cattle Hill and Pacifica are proposed or have been tentatively proposed to be under Park Service management, but that is not now. And I do not see Flager Estate on here either. I would think that some of you that live in this area would be aware of Flager Estate. And that is also a park that, it, that the Park Service allows uh, uh, equestrian use, which is a big pet, by the way. Okay, so I'm very disappointed in this. I think this is a fairly mediocre resolution myself. Another thing, too, is whereas number seven, immediately following uh, its release, the, the draft dog management plan environmental impact uh, statement generated significant negative feedback from over 47, well, from over 47 heaven comment letters from the public a strong opposition to it, to the Park Service's uh, plan. Now, 4,700, I'm excuse, uh, 4,700 people out of uh, three, the tri-county area, Marin and San Francisco and San Mateo, is a very small amount of people, considering the length of time that comment period was open. So I really think you all, I would like to see you put this on hold and maybe uh, give it uh, another shot, and you really should have this meeting in the evening so that other people could attend this thing. This is difficult for people working. Anyway, that's all I have to say, thanks. Marlene Finley. Hello, I'm Marlene Finley, Director of San Mateo County Parks. Um, good afternoon, uh, honorable members of the board and uh, Deputy County Manager Frales and County Council Byers. Um, although the, the topic before you is the Golden Gate National Recreation Draft Dog Management Policy, um, I did want to mention today that it often begs the question, well, what are we doing in San Mateo County Parks around dog management? So I'm, uh, I, I'm here to encourage you to have an open pro public process to review our do current dog management policy. As you know, the San Mateo County Parks has a, an ordinance that prohibits dogs in the county parks. 
although we do have some dog friendly areas where we allow dogs on leash and those are um, the regional trails such as the coastal trail that uh, goes through the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve along the Dardanelle Trail um, near the Pillar Point uh, the Pillar Point Bluffs and also the Bay Trail through Coyote Point Park. We also allow dogs now in the newly acquired Wicklow property adjacent to Quarry Park and that's because in the deed of acceptance of that property it allows for continued dog, um, dog use in that park. So um, today I'm offering that uh, we provide, San Mateo County Parks provides the staff support if you were to have um, uh, another look at our dog management policy. And um, here today with us is uh, Natural Resource Manager Ramona Arechica, who's done extensive research on dog management, and we're um, happy to provide information that Ramona's compiled. Thank you. Thank you for your, um, thank you for your comments. I, I do think it would be a good idea, you know, perhaps in the fall, to, to, to look at our, our policies within uh, San Mateo County. So. Uh, We'll see if we can get that scheduled. Um, I can't, uh, we, uh, do we have a motion? Yeah, All right, and, and just as a point of clarification, so you're, you're saying that you, you don't, we're not voting on this resolution? The only, on the only, uh, I'm just asking that, we asked GGNRA to adopt a more inclusive and communally acceptable dog management plan. Okay, so are we uh, going on record opposing preferred alternative F? Well, yeah, I guess, well, I guess so. If that's what we're asking them to have a more inclusive uh, and acceptable dog management policy. Okay, I mean, it sounds like the um, the last resolve probably covers it, right? The, the Board of Supervisors, we opposed the GGNRA preferred alternative F and requested the GGNRA consider a more inclusive preferred alternative? Yes. Okay. Do we have questions or, or discussion? I, I'd just like to thank Director Finley for, for coming today because I, I've been very i just reluctant to tell the GGNRA what to do about dogs when in the majority of our parks we don't allow dogs ourselves. So I, I, feel, I feel like we're kind of butting heads here. And so I would like um, kind of a letter uh, as opposed to a, to a formal resolution. And just what my comment really has to do with the fact that the uh, – at least on the coast side, most of the areas that that they have recently taken into the GGNRA have been for decades used by dog walkers, and so the uh, I just I'm asking them to uh, rethink that, and uh, and, and that, that's essentially it. Right, Suzanne. Um, you know, and I understand where Carol's coming from as far as you know. We don't want to be a contradiction to ourselves, but. The way I look at it is we've never, in a lot of our parks, allowed for dogs to be there. In this case, what concerns me is that a lot of these areas have been allowed, they've allowed dogs either on leash or off leash, and they want to change that. And I, that's the part that concerns me. And I do think I'm fine with just sending a letter. I mean, I've already sent a letter because I go to Fort Funston with my dog, a lot of dogs off leash, you know, and to turn around and want to undo that to me is problematic because just because we live in such a densely popula populated area up in closer to San Francisco. So I'm fine with having the board send a letter just to, to make sure it's more inclusive and really not take away what currently exists. That's my concern, not so much, you know, trying to change things, uh, you know, that, that weren't there before. I agree. All right, so the motion is to... Um, Mr. President, could I just ask a quick part, question? Yes, yeah. um, this is probably for the county manager's office, but to President Pine's point about bringing back uh, the conversation about San Mateo County's... Uh, park dog policy. Will that be a report back item or how will that, what's that process? Uh, yes, yeah, Supervisor Slocum, we can bring it back in uh, September. I think, I think we would you know, want to agendize it. We'd want to have a discussion about it for sure, I, I believe. Um, so, all right, so there's a motion to uh, authorize, uh, uh, I guess the county manager to prepare this letter, or, or I guess it'd be under, I guess it'd be under, I guess we, I guess it would perhaps be, be under my name, I guess as president, then to prepare a letter on behalf of the county uh, stating our, our desire that the GDNRA consider a more inclusive, consider a more inclusive um, approach. Okay. Then um, I think we had the motion in a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so we're completed with that item. Board member reports. 
Mr. Horsley, you want to start today? Uh, I think I just uh, you know, actually uh, did attend your sea level rise and uh, thought that it, uh, it was informative and really well done, and congratulations to you. I think somebody has to start talking about that, and uh, you've taken the leadership on that. I just want to commend you for taking leadership on an issue that I think is the critical issue of our times. And to you, and it's, uh, uh, I was going to say supervisor, but uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spear and uh, Rich Gordon did, a, a, I think, a phenomenal job putting together that um, seminar. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Supervisor Green? Um, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, yesterday in South San Francisco, we opened a new core agency that, uh, which will be, those services will be provided by the YMCA. So uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, uh, just kind of a, a, a very positive new development for the core services in uh, South City. So uh, please that that's going forward. Oh, okay, I do have an adjourn in memory of John Thomas Bennett, uh, actually called Jack Bennett, who passed away June 12, 2014. He was a uh, member of the Daly City community. Um, he was one of the founding members of Our Lady of Mercy Parish in its school. Um, he leaves behind his uh, children, his six children, his ten grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren, and he will be sorely missed. Mr. Slocum? No report, thank you. Okay, we'll adjourn to closed session. Fifteen or twenty minutes behind. That's what that's what that's what John Byron. That's what John. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to uh, July first board study session on homelessness. Thank you all very much for being here. Before we begin, uh, Mr. Byers is going to report out from closed session. Thank you, Vice President Groom. Uh, the board did meet in closed session to consider uh, three different items. Uh, the board did take one uh, action on, on, uh, on one item, and specifically the board, uh, by unanimous vote, uh, agreed to, um, to approve a workers' compensation settlement involving uh, employee Haikoti, former employee Haikoti Fakawa in the amount of $125,000. Uh, and that concludes my report. Really honest with you, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't think of her name. That's okay. So, really uh, Ms. Rodriguez, you want to begin? Thank you. Honorable members of the board, Mrs. Ferales, Mr. Byers, I'm Ileana Rodriguez with the Human Services Agency, and it's my pleasure uh, to be here today to speak to you about homelessness and what we've done. In terms of the Human Services Agency, we're responsible for uh, through the hum through the excuse me through uh, the homeless and safety net services uh, division, our responsibility is to coordinate the homelessness continuum of care. And the Hope Interagency Council and administer contracts for the community-based providers. I want to thank Supervisor Horsley for sponsoring this session this afternoon. So, let's get started. Ileana, can I ask, or Beck, can I ask a question? Sure. Is we're not, we're having trouble on this end hearing the volume. Is it is the volume? Red lights on. Wait, I'm yeah, pull it in. Closer. Yeah, is this better? Like this, okay. So the goals for today are to achieve a common understanding of our approach uh, to the homelessness situation in our county review some of the accomplishments, the local data, understand the 
current federal policy direction and get some uh, direction from this board in terms of what you would like us to focus on in the future and given what uh, we'll discuss with the uh, federal policy, how you'd like us to approach that. So the issue of homelessness is can't, can't be accomplished alone, and we as a county rely on many partners uh, to do this. In terms of government, it's the board and the county managers' offices who support us. The county departments engaged are the Human Services Agency, housing, of course, and our behavioral health and recovery. Work groups. We have uh, fantastic participation from our HOPE Interagency Council, the Homeless Continuum of Care Group, and our community action agencies. In addition, we have our nonprofit partners, our core agencies, our faith-based providers, the homelessness shelter providers, and other CBOs throughout the county. We couldn't do this without our cities, and to that effect, we have participation from Redwood City, South San Francisco, East Palo Alto, Daly City, Pacifica, San Mateo, and Half Moon Bay. Hope. Hope was our 10-year plan to end homelessness, which was developed back in 2006 by various stakeholders. At that time, we agreed to six key strategic uh, initiatives to guide our plan. One, goal, prevent homelessness. Conduct outreach and education. Connect homeless, homeless people to mainstream resources. Expand our housing options. Measure success and report on our outcomes. And building leadership and political will to address this issue. What have we done under the HOPE plan? We've increased the inventory by 539 units through new construction and vouchers. We've assisted over 3,800 families who were at risk of becoming homeless. 34% secured permanent housing. We assisted 16,700 households at risk. 81% stayed in their home increased stakeholder collaboration to develop supporting housing. That was accomplished through housing vouchers, the Venadome Hotel, El Camino Family Housing. Intensive outreach and engagement with chronically homeless through our hot teams and the Homeless Connect events. And then securing new sources of funding uh, which enabled us to recreate the community action agencies, uh, we got additional grants leveraging more federal dollars and targeted initiatives, new grants from also the Veterans Administration. Just yesterday, we received word that our funding was renewed by the federal government and in addition to that, received an additional $250,000. So in terms of our funding stream, from last year, you'll see it was 18.4 million approximately uh, dedicated to the issue of homelessness. 48%, I'd, a little deceptive, it says 48% in terms of federal dollars. It's 8.9 million, but when you account for the one-time county dollars for affordable housing, capital improvements, the federal share is really larger, it's probably closer to 74% of our annual uh, budget. Julian? Yes. So the 28%, that, that was that uh, 13 million that was RDA money, is that what that, or portion of that represents? Portion of it, yes. So the, the breakdown. How much, of, how much of that funding is ongoing? General funds 2.3. Okay. Measure A's 1.2 million, and there was the uh, capital improvement 5.2 million, which has to do with uh, we hope and some other projects, and we'll break them down in a little bit. But most of that money is one-time. One-time initiatives. Thank you. So 
So the total commitment by this board, we'll take a look, a deeper dive, 8.6 million, 53% committed to emergency housing, 26% in transitional housing, 12% in prevention, and about 1% in terms of staffing and outreach and engagement. In addition to that, this board has committed for fiscal year 1415 through affordable housing funds 13.2 million. You'll see the 8 million is slated for affordable and permanent housing. And then the 5.2 million with support renovation and expansion for emergency shelters and temporary housing. In terms of emergency shelters, the dollars are earmarked for renovation of 90 existing beds at Safe Harbor, the renovation and expansion of 75 beds to 140 beds at Maple Street Shelter, that's 2.2 million, and the expansion from 50 to 100 beds at Project We Hope. Transitional housing funds, it's the renovation and expansion from 14 to 15 units at the Family Crossroads Center, uh, Center. At the end of all these initiatives, the board will have uh, funded 300, 345 beds, a net increase of 116 beds in our inventory. This slide shows you what our homeless continuum of care consists of today, and we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into how much money uh, is allocated to each of these uh, approaches and what the strategies are behind them. In terms of the strategy for preventing homelessness, the core services agencies provide emergency assistance and food, shelter, and utilities. They also conduct the eligibility, screening, and processing of emergency housing assistance. The community action agencies tried to fill a gap uh, through rental assistance, bus passes, to our extremely low income population. The funding is 1.6 million, and you'll see the bulk of it is in county funds. In terms of accomplishments, I'm happy to report that today our, is the first day our core agencies went live on the Clarity Human Services System. In addition, for seven months, we operated, the county operated the core agency at South San Francisco. Yesterday, we handed that over to our no, new partner in South San Francisco, uh, the YMCA. With the board's commitment, we expanded funding for emergency housing assistance and reestablished the community action agencies of which Supervisor Groom is a member. In terms of outreach and engagement, uh, you'll see it's all county funds, and the strategies there are the Homeless Connect events and hot teams. In terms of Homeless Connect, these are events hosted in the communities where we provide a variety of services to homeless. While it was initially started at the county level, the cities have taken this over. It includes services such as the dental van, clothing, haircuts, basic services, in hopes of engaging with the population and linking them to some housing assistance. The homeless outreach teams, or HOT, were started in San Mateo under the leadership of Chief Mannheimer. The model has been replicated throughout the county, and the goal is to conduct outreach to the chronically homeless, single disabled adults who've been homeless for extended periods of time. The HOT teams bring police, and Envision Shelter Network staff together to conduct intensive engagement with people living on the streets to build trust, which will lead them to access services, ideally. Through County Measure A, the county, through County Measure A funding, the county has expanded the HOT teams, and we have them now in South San Francisco, San Bruno, Pacifica, Half Moon Bay, the Coast, San Mateo, Redwood City, East Palo Alto, and Menlo Park. This slide 
gives you an overview of our inventory. You have a total of 1,536 cases, uh, beds in the inventory. Very small, important to point out to you here for our discussion a little bit. 24 beds are currently in our rapid rehousing, and we have 554 in transitional, 662 in permanent and supportive housing. And it'll be important as we talk about the federal shift uh, in vision. So emer emergency housing. We have 5.3 million in total funding dedicated to that. Again, a bulk of it is county dollars. The funds from the federal government are for emergency shelter and supportive services. The, from the state, we get a little bit of CalWORKs dollars in here to support our motel voucher programs. The county expends on exp uh, motor, motel voucher programs for families, supports the incremental weather program for individuals. One-time funding also this past year went for the Redwood City fire victims and affordable housing funds to support capital improvement projects. In terms of emergency shelters, shelters provide a place for the homeless to sleep for one night. In the winter, the county has increased the shelter capacity based on the night's temperature and provided additional cots so that no county resident is left without a bed. There are 298 emergency shelter beds in this county with at least 65 homeless on the wait list according to Envision Sh uh, Shelter Network. Through, me through Measure A funding, we converted Project We Hope from a warming shelter to a year-round shelter. Funding was provided to renovate their existing site and to expand the shelter beds. We also have the motel vouchers. Our motel voucher program is administered by Envision Shelter Network and continues to play a critical role in addressing the homelessness issue in this county. Rapid rehousing. For rapid rehousing, this program provides intensive short-term case management services focused on locating and securing housing. In our county, these services are provided by Envision Shelter Network. This is the priority of the federal government, and while San Mateo County has done some work in this area, this is where HUD would like the focus to shift to in the future. Transitional housing. So transitional, here's 54% of our inventory, right, in terms of beds. 1.7 million is our federal funding, and the rest is county uh, funds. The definition the federal government has for transitional housing is that it's designed to provide housing and appropriate supportive services to homeless individuals to facilitate movement from independent living within 24 months or a longer period if approved by HUD. The federal definition is very different than what is occurring in our county, and we'll, we'll explain what Envision uh, is doing. Again, there, have, there are 554 beds. They're short-term, time-limited units intended as temporary housing situations. We receive federal funding for our continuum of care for the special needs populations. Some programs provide services to assist with financial planning and et cetera, or f financial literacy, I should say. The Department of Housing has allocated $2.2 million to small-scale transitional housing projects. So the federal position here is that the model prolongs homelessness because it's an interim solution. They would rather we rehouse quickly and it's important for me to point out that the national model's definition of two years is different. Envision Shelter Network is rehousing within 120 days and working to bring those 120 days down to 90. It's also important to point out that Envision Shelter Network's success is 80%. Uh, if you saw the recent articles in this weekend's newspaper, 
they run something very similar, their success rate is similar to the Salt Lake City model. In addition, 250 uh, homeless vouchers are in this inventory uh, provided by our housing department. 100 are Section 8 vouchers for low-income individuals, 110 for Veterans Assistance Services, the BASH vouchers, and 40 uh, vouchers are provided for re-entry population and victims of domestic violence. In terms of the homeless uh, count, you'll note we do this every other year, and it's growing. We have about 1,300 unsheltered. 982 individuals are sheltered. In 2009, it increased. The reason for the increase is the number of homeless people living in vehicles and camps over the past several count, or other the past, past several counts we did not count individuals living in vans, RVs, or encampments. We improved upon that within the last two counts, and I think you're starting to see them captured in the numbers. We've done a better job of locating our homeless. We partner with homeless uh, guides to inform us of where these encampments are and where people are living. So they actually guide uh, us through the count, and it's not a surprise that the numbers are rising. So from 2011 to 2013, fewer unsheltered homeless families, a 24% decrease in the number of homelessness on the street, a 10% increase of individuals in emergency shelters, and an 83% increase in the number of homeless living in vehicles. Here's a snapshot of the unsheltered homeless. From 2013, it's homeless count. We learned that the number living on the streets is decreasing, but the number living in cars appears to be increasing. This is an imprecise uh, count. It's not perfect science here. We surveyed some of these individuals and find that they're single adults. Almost 70% are over 40 and a large population have pets. A number of our shelters do not accept pets. This gives you a distribution of what the percentage of ho homeless is in each of our cities. The other category is where there were less than 20 in the count. We grouped the cities. It also does not capture individuals living in sheds or garage, shacks, and other places that are not meant for human habitation. In terms of data trend, what we're seeing, on the left you'll see the one bedroom apartment, rents are rising, and our homelessness are rising, while unemployment is dipping. And since this graph, it's dipped more. We're probably at 4.1% in terms of unemployment in this county. So we have a housing crisis. The federal shift. The federal, the federal government is shifting its philosophy in terms of how they believe homelessness should be solved. They want jurisdictions to focus on housing the homeless. It means if it's a homeless problem, the way you fix it is by housing them rapidly. Their belief is that the best practice is rapid rehousing of individuals, give them first and last month's rent and security deposit, increase the inventory of permanent housing, focus on the reduction of homelessness, and they would, I think there's a shift to not fund the case management uh, components or the transitional beds. And that's an issue given of where our inventory exists in this county and just the issue of uh, the success we've seen with some case management in the Envision Care uh, system. HUD seeks a system overhaul of the standardization 
of our continuum of care. They want there to be a standardization in terms of the point of entry. And we started that today with having a case management system in place. We can start to standardize that. That there be one assessment or criteria. That the rehousing plan, uh, that there, it be focused on rehousing homeless as quickly as possible. And that there be a new set of performance measures, that being how quickly you house and the instances of reoccurrence of homelessness. Those seem to be where they're leaning today in terms of performance measures. So what do we know? Homelessness is on the rise in this county. The unsheltered homeless in San, Mateo, in San Mateo County grew since our last count. While we've made significant efforts to serve these in need through the continuum of care, from homeless prevention to permanent supportive housing, there still remains a group of homeless that we've been unable to secure housing for. Rental prices are on the rise, and we need a county dialogue to ensure we do not discourage people we do not discharge people from our institutions, whether that's jail, uh, when they foster youth emancipates, or our hospitals. We need to ensure continued funding from HUD. Obviously, the nine million is significant. What's the best way to do that? What should the plan look like? Uh, what should be our shift? We have years of HMIS, which is the system all the providers enter data into. We've never done an analysis of that data, uh, and it's sitting there. It's an opportunity that can guide, guide us. We now know somewhat of our current environment, and we need direction from the board in terms of priority. So HUD funds almost $9 million to end, the homeless, uh, to end homelessness. Without analyzing and proposing changes to our current system, we'll be less competitive in future years for this money. There are some national best practices out there, but we need to analyze them in the, contents, the context of the cost of living of our county. Yes? Glenn, the county funding may be at risk I mean, is if we don't adopt the federal model of, um, of the rapid rehousing? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That nine million. Thanks. And after years of planning, HUD has adopted new standards, uh, new performance data standards. Uh, our HMIS system is not compliant. We have to be compliant by October 1st. Uh, Clarity provides an opportunity for this board. The Clarity Human Services System that our core agency were just placed on is HUD compliant. Uh, we could receive direction from the board to move towards that system. What it does uh, for this board is it starts to create a master client index. You're going to be able to see the population uh, throughout various entry points. So I assume you need funding for that. Yes. The clarity system year one is about $180,000 just for conversion, implementation, and what have you. Can I ask you a question? Sorry. Sure. I was a little confused. Maybe you can just walk me through it again. Sorry to slow you down. Um, you said that the clarity system was implemented today, I thought. For our core agencies. For your core agencies. And then just a moment ago, you said maybe this board should give you direction about moving toward that clarity system. For our oh. housing. Ah, OK. Thank you provides an opportunity to have not only the cores, but you can have our housing partners on it also. I understand. Thank you. So here's some potential action items is we need to analyze the current service delivery model as well as the data and its outcome. We may want to revisit our plan and our delivery model to see what is appropriate. We need to look at our current HMIS data. 
Uh, Orange County just did that, by the way, last year and shifted the way they approached homelessness. Uh, it's probably a good step to take prior to modifying or rewriting our homeless plan. We have the clarity system option. We know that at times we discharge people from our county programs into homelessness. There's an opportunity also for the board to provide direction. In June, you've passed various funding commitments, and there are some, I think, that are tied to transitional beds. Uh, some direction, is that still the course you'd like us to focus on? Uh, housing may be able to speak to that more. The 5.2 million in terms, there's some in transitional housing, knowing what you know about the federal uh, directive, is that still the course you'd like us to keep. Ileana, can I ask a question? You mm -hmm. know, obviously we're getting this information from the feds, but do they show any kind of uh, sense of, of uh, how well it's performed? I mean, you know, we're talking about the way we've done transitional in this county, and we're at about an 80%, mm -hmm. you know, getting people back on their feet. Do, do they have statistics as to how their program works in relationship to actually getting people back on their feet? I haven't seen any, but um, there are some individuals, Kate Bristol may have some information on it. I would say, you want to? I would say that, um, why don't you come up? Why don't you come Kate, up? Kate, could you, Kate, yeah, Kate. Can you come up here? <laughs> A little process challenged, I'm sorry. Um, you might recall back when the stimulus was passed, we had the HPRP program, Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing, which was a big one-time infusion of federal dollars. So in many communities, they used a lot of that money for this rapid rehousing approach of um, trying to very quickly move people into housing and giving them three to six to maybe nine months of rental assistance. So that data has been looked at nationally, and they found one of the reasons HUD is very um, uh, much interested in further investing in raptory housing as they found the results were really impressive. So people got housed very quickly and they didn't return to homelessness. So if you compare the dollars you invested in rapid rehousing versus what you invest in a longer term transitional housing model, for the same dollars, more people get housed and they're not coming back to homelessness any, at any higher of a rate. So that's, that's, that's really kind of the underlying policy foundation for it. And how long was the period of that rapid rehousing? Is it a 30 day, 60 day? So it's um, it's basically a transition in place concept. So you it can vary. So like the limp, the, the least would be, as Ileana said, uh, first and last month's rent, oh, and I then see. that's it. People don't need any more. Typically, the way it has worked is to start with three months, and then if the person still needs assistance after the three months, you give them another three months, and then another. And actually, you know, you can go all the way out 15 months, but most programs look at like six months is a good target for the amount of assistance. And I just want to emphasize, this is not a model that's appropriate for people who have, are chronically homeless and profoundly disabled who really need permanent supportive housing, which we have done very, very well in this community, I would say. And um, I don't, not in any way advocating we not do permanent supportive housing, and we certainly need more of it, but that there are other homeless people who are not chronically homeless for whom the rapid rehousing approach um, the feds are certainly telling us that is the direction they'd like to see communities going. Thank you. Follow up question to that. On the rapid rehousing, um, do we have a sense for what segment of our population would kind of fit the criteria, uh, or is that subject to more analysis? Yeah. I think it, unless Envision has any data on that today, do you? Qualitative. Qualitative? Yeah. I think it's going to require more data analysis. Can, can I just interject? A, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you probably already saw this thing on the, uh, on the weekend in the Chronicle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily the greatest newspaper, but in any case, they uh, let me just give you a copy of it. But this is a, it's a, it really is a comparison of this rapid rehousing. And what they did do is they built, they actually built, it's a city of a million, and one would think, oh, Salt Lake City is a lot different than 
And I, I grant you, I'm sure it's a lot different than San Francisco, but it probably is a, more similar to us. And they actually had 3,000 chronic homeless people uh, in their parks, um, and they actually have reduced it to as now it's, according to the article and uh, according to reports, statistically zero. And they have done it by uh, basically housing first. It, it takes about two months to get people into housing. But the critical issue was that they actually built a 1,000 units. Um, so it's kind of an interesting. It's a model that has been adopted in other major cities. Since that, you know, the Chronicle obviously is recommending that San Francisco do something similar to that. But, you know, I thought it was fairly interesting that it's a model that um, Kate has talked to us at the Home uh, or Hope Project before that if you want to deal with homelessness, you have to have houses. You have to have housing. And, uh, you know, the housing market in San Mateo County is – Good news and bad news. Good news, you know, and it's it's if you have a house, uh, you know, the appreciation is going up. But we're now seeing uh, rentals going up and up. And uh, you know, and there's not a lot of below market or at or below market rate housing being built anyplace. And inclusionary housing seems to. I mean, I don't know what the status is in most cities, but it doesn't. We're not really building houses. And, and the other is, you know, I was on this Rena project or it's every year I'm sure other we all know what it is it's a regional housing allocation in San Mateo County we're supposed to build 4,595 units for low or very low income people meaning that it's for you know from zero or plus something at most the top the top is 39,600 and so far in our project um we built 539, so we're we're falling short. And you know, if we're going to deal with housing, or that is uh, homelessness, you have to deal with housing. So we are at six years into our hope plan, and two years left. So some direction in terms of um, what you'd like us to focus on immediately, uh, and is there a shift in policy? What would you like us uh, to do? Uh, well, I, there's a whole lot of things I'd like us to do. <laughs> but obviously, one of the things yeah. is, uh, is that, uh, that 180000 for um, to uh, for uh, – I do think we need to have a system analyst. We need to look at – to have uh, better data, so I'm certainly supportive of that. Uh, the other mention, I think, in our earlier today, we talked about the number of foster kids go entering into homelessness. About, I think you, some, I think you said forty percent. Yes. So you now we have people coming out of our hospitals, come out of jails, out of foster care, who are homeless. So I think our departments have to work together so that we're not discharging people into homelessness. Um, and, you know, and we all we all have done the homeless council. We all find these encampments all over the county and I, and I know I get calls from city council people say oh you've got to do something about this encampment that's in behind the Safeway or behind the Albertson or behind you know uh, a building so um, and, and we're not we're, 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 we're I think we do a great job but we're treading water and we're not it's not like you said is that it went down for a short period of time and now it's going back up so um, I do think we have to redesign the system. And I, I thought we put some money in the budget to work on a redesign, if we, if I'm not mistaken. We have $100,000 yeah, $100, set aside already by the board uh, pending direction today. Uh, you what, know, what was the 100000 for? Excuse me, Supervisor. What was the 100000 It was to be allocated to uh, – it was set aside for today's discussion in terms of what direction the board would – is it to do analysis? Is it to rewrite the plan? Um, is it to bring us into compliance? Yeah. I, mean, I know we have a, a number of speakers, but besides that, I, I want to think that uh, the chart shows that in uh, my district has roughly seven, well, over in the coast side, has roughly 7% of the county population, but we've got 20% of the unsheltered homeless. Um, we, and. And uh, we, you know, people on the coast side have to realize we cannot shove all of our problems over onto the 101 corridor or to Redwood City or San Mateo or Daly City. So, you know, I'm, I, I'll uh, prepare to look at potential sites over the coast side for housing for very low-income folks. 
We uh, go ahead, Carol, yeah. Supervisor Groom. I, I was going to say we, maybe okay. folks make some a couple of comments. I'll that, take the public. Comment. I would say maybe you want to have your comments first, though. No, go ahead. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, we do have uh, a couple speakers, so uh, we'll start with Melissa Platt and Brian Greenberg. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Platt. I'm the Executive Director of the Mental Health Association of San Mateo County. We've been working with people who are homeless and have special needs, particularly people with mental illness, um, HIV and AIDS and people with alcohol and other drug problems since 1986. So this is a problem that we certainly experienced back in the 80s and saw grow um, exponentially through the 90s when many of the SROs closed down, when board and care homes that had once been available for our clients ceased to exist as people sold houses and moved out of the county. Um, this Today, when we're trying to find housing for our population, we keep meeting with the same issues that everyone else does, plus one, which is that our clients are not welcome in every community. So they face that issue combined, of course, with the fact that they typically exist at 15% of area median income or less, which is not very attractive to landlords. And that was the reason that we've been buying, rehabbing, developing our own housing, because even affordable housing developers know that subsidizing these kinds of units and staying afloat is extremely difficult. So I just want to put in a pitch for not only um, additional funding for supportive housing, but one of the critical elements, and I think one of the things that I am most concerned about with the HUD shift, is that as HUD shifts more and back to bricks and mortar and you know short-term emergency assistance for people who are homeless, without the additional supportive services for folks, without some kind of additional subsidy, the people will get into housing and even with rapid rehousing may lose it. And I'm talking in particular about people with special needs. So I just want to be sure that they get you know, addressed in this issue and that we are all cognizant of the fact that the support piece is critical if we plan to be successful. Uh, President Pine, just to make a comment about the, that's exact, oh, am I over, I'm done? <laughs> but <laughs> that's exactly what they do in Salt Lake is that the, it, it's not as if it's just housing, it's also housing with lots of uh, support. Wrap around services. Right. Well, I gave that to you at least my notes. I gave it, you said Brian Greenberg was next. We do have Brian Gr Greenberg's card. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Brian Greenberg with Envision Shelter Network. Um, I want to spend uh, just a, a moment talking about uh, all the things that are right, because I think we do a lot of things great in this county. We, vir we have virtually no unsheltered children, the, the one-day homeless count. Uh, it's the county's commitment to the motel voucher program, the family shelters, um, the continuum of detox and outreach workers, and the mental health system in the county, and the substance abuse recovery system. There's really a wonderful continuum to assist people in getting off the street. Um, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's unlike um, neighboring counties. So, you know, just to acknowledge uh, what's really working well in the county, I think is important. Um, we are huge supporters of rapid rehousing and housing first. The problem is our residents who have 850, 950, 1050 an hour uh, incomes, there's, there's virtually no unemployment at that level. We get them all jobs, but even with two parent incomes, they can't afford an apartment in San Mateo County. So uh, we have a poster in each one of our shelters that says what a one and two bedroom apartment averages throughout California. And unfortunately, many people have to transfer those jobs to Yolo and Stanislaus and Solano counties where you can have a life on an $11 an hour job. It's just very, very difficult in this county. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that, you know, we have outreach workers, uh, Coast Side and Pacifica, Half Moon Bay. It's very, very difficult for both individuals and families, especially families who have kids enrolled in the Half Moon Bay School District. Um, it's very, very difficult for them to access shelters. Um, so I think as far as, you know, structurally, uh, the deficit in the county is uh, drop in, family shelters, individual shelters west of the coastal range. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, Kari Lyle. Uh, 
Hi, I, I'm Kare Lyle. I'm the CEO of Envision Shelter Network. Um, first, thank you for this session today, supervisors, and thank you to Ileana and her team. It was a, a terrific presentation. I think really uh, uh, is in alignment with what we're seeing. I wanted to emphasize a couple of points. One is, um, as Dr. Bryan was saying and, and, and Melissa was saying, the context of the economics in this region are making us really struggle with the concept of rapid yeah. rehousing. Yeah. What is the definition of rapid? If you live in an area where there's lots of inventory, you can absolutely take someone from a car and put them into an apartment. And everyone is in agreement that intact families and stable families make for a better community. What we're challenged with is getting people into that permanent housing quickly. Right now, as uh, Ileana stated, Envision Shelter Network has, on average, between 120 to 150 days, is the fastest we can take a family that is in our shelter and get their savings to a point where they can move into an apartment and find them the apartment. If we had some dollars for their down payment, that would speed it up a little bit. But rapid is still going to be around 90 to 100 days in this area just because you're waiting for an apartment. And you can go get in line in the apartment, and it's gone. And you got to try another apartment, and it's gone, right? So we need a little bit more time, I think. And that's why our HUD funding is a little bit at risk. They're trying to really reduce the number of shelter days. It's cheaper. That's true. But in our economy here that we enjoy in Silicon Valley, the economics and the price of the housing makes it harder for low-income people to get into that housing more quickly. So in the next 20 years, when we have tons of affordable housing, we'll be great. Until that time, our low-income uh, earners are trying to live in market-rate housing, which requires a little more time. And of course, there's always the stability that they get with case management and so forth in the shelters. So we thank you for your time today. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we have. Uh, Morton Frank and, and Joshua Ugg. Thank you, President Pine and members of the board. Uh, Morton Frank, 105 Birch Street, Redwood City. In my um, architectural practice running back to the mid-60s, I don't want to do the math, but that sounds like about a half a century, most of my work is related to facilities for homeless folks and people with other special needs. And um, I've done projects uh, as far away as New York, Orlando, New Orleans, and of course here in the Bay Area region. And so I've uh, dealt with, pardon me, I've dealt with folks and had to solve planning problems before we even designed buildings for the entire gamut of pathologies, uh, all the way from a very long-term, very chronic, disabled, mentally and physically disabled folks to the other end of the spectrum, a family that suddenly had a, a life issue that uh, they found themselves out on the street. And what it is that I have found, I don't have the statistics uh, to present to you, but I have 50 years worth of uh, observation and um, anecdotes to the effect that irrespective of the pathologies involved, the life issues that, uh, that folks are dealing with, if we all, everybody in this room and, and the board with respect, um, get a sense of what is home. Look at it in your, in your tummy and in your heart. What is the experience of being home, having a home? If you have some experience of home on some level, then I would submit the board in your deliberations and questions put to you and analyses that you'll go through if you get in touch with the experience of home within yourself, knowing full well and realizing that you accomplished what you accomplished, which is huge, each of you in your personal and professional lives, with home, you operate better. Now, uh, just last question. I was on our county's Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness, uh, chaired by Tom Nolan and, and Frank Pagliero, a long time ago, and we, in fact, formulated the genesis of what is now a housing trust fund. And this premise about maintaining a sense and experience of home, if you allow that to guide you in your deliberations, we can solve a lot of this through 
what I would call unconventional means. I mean, the 3,000 people in the park and wherever it was, Fresno. If you get in touch with what that experience is of home, you will find you can get a lot more creative about how you'd even deal with 3,000 people in a park. Thank you very much. Thank you. And a, a Joshua Hug followed by uh, Pastor Baines. Hey, um, Josh Hug, Housing Leadership Council. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk about the um, nuances of, of managing chronic homelessness, but I, I did want to just highlight a couple opportunities that may be worth considering, uh, particularly now that um, we're also in housing element season, which is an, uh, another opportunity to, um, to look at housing in a more holistic manner because they really are interconnected. Um, the first one was to look at the graphs that were presented earlier. Um, there was a reference there to the county affordable housing funds. If you recall last year, uh, the county had the foresight to uh, reallocate. It was a one-time opportunity to reallocate former redevelopment funds that were earmarked for housing across all the entities in the county, uh, send that back into affordable housing production, and, and you did that. Um, there is the matter of the ongoing tax increment finance that RDAs produce for the length of their of their um, of the time of their of their um, of the air project area. Um, you may want to look at it's a much smaller amount, but reallocating a, a good portion of that back into affordable housing. Um, in traditional RDAs, it's twenty percent. Um, something else, which um, I think um, Brian Greenberg alluded to, I think it was this is probably the third forum I've heard him talk about this this idea of displacement because you get a job but it just doesn't pay. Um, which talks also about this idea of the jobs housing fit. Um, we, we always shoot for this one-to-one -one balance between jobs and housing. Um, when you break it down by income, uh, lower incomes have a tremendously skewed, more on the order of five, six. The town of Colma is actually on the order of 48 to one. When you look at low-income jobs to housing that they can afford, um, it really changes your perspective about how we're meeting our housing needs. Um, so. In response to that, in lieu of the production of new affordable housing or even market rate housing uh, that would produce natural affordability, I would take a serious look. This is a serious vulnerability in our county, the idea of tenant protections. And that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. But one way to, to prevent homelessness is to somehow stem this tremendous fluctuation that, that People that lower income communities experience every time there's a boom and a bust in San Mateo County where the rents go skyrocketing up and then they'll drop a bit in this downturn. We didn't see that because the foreclosure crisis displaced a lot of homeowners into rentals. Um, it's a huge roller coaster that lower income communities just cannot withstand. And the ultimate result of that is that they may still have a job here, but they are pushed out of the county. And uh, that is a serious burden to handle. Uh, for any length of time. Thank you. Thank you for your for your comments. And uh, Pastor Baines. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for having the forethought to have this as a discussion. Um, and thank you for your leadership um, in dealing with the housing. Uh, I agree with all the previous comments made uh, by our comrades here. Um, I am of faith, so I'm going to say it like this. <laughs> God is not making any more land. And um, a preacher friend of mine said, no land, no landing. Um, is there a way where the um, county can partner closer with the cities to look at some of the county-owned land in the various uh, communities and um, really look at putting in a major dent in the affordable high-density housing area. And I, I know that gets a little bit political, of, you know, not my backyard type stuff. Um, but we do know that East Palo Alto is interested, and I'm sure there's other cities that is interested if they knew there was a, a, a real strong um, possibility in partnership with the county of San Mateo and maybe the county can assign someone 
to bird dog this effort um, in this partnership and looking at how can we create more high density housing, um, but it's a partnership with the county, the federal and, and the state and uh, the local city. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Laura Bent. Good afternoon. I just, uh, I also want to echo my colleagues and say thank you for this time this afternoon. Um, it's great that I'm going after Pastor Baines because I echo his comments as well um, around looking at this affordable housing issue in our county um, as, a, as a premier focus because as HUD turns its uh, expectations, um, our issue is going to grow. And if we do not have the affordable housing, we're not going to be able to meet the needs, absolutely. I also want to say, just in reference to Leona's comments around the data, um, we, we at Samaritan House, and again, we have the blessing of being both a core agency and being a, a mm -hmm. shelter provider. We're excited about the Clarity System um, due to the fact that we'll be able to analyze the data a little bit deeper. And I do think it's important to look at the data because as we look as the, at the different clientele that are walking through the door, we have you know, those who are the homeless prevention clientele, we, are those, we have those who we could rapidly rehouse, and we have those that probably need the transitional shelter or some sort of respite care because we are seeing a growing need in the people being released from medical care. So I think looking at the data is important, having accurate data in front of us is important, and uh, we've been doing that for at least you know, a year um, just to sort of identify which pocket people fall into so we can better assess how to help them in a more efficient and productive way. So I would urge sort of taking the time to look at the data and analyzing what sort of clientele that we're looking at um, to be able to better, more efficiently help them. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your, your comments. So um, come back to the board for other comments and thoughts. Um, well, I, uh, I have a few more thoughts. Uh, actually, uh, I was looking at um, one of the things that, uh, you know, talking about uh, the problems over in the coast side, and, and I have talked to uh, Brian uh, Greenberg, or Dr. Brian from Envision Shelter Network. We, you know, we do realize that on the coast side, we do have a significant number of people who are homeless and essentially living and essentially encampments uh, in creeks and fields uh, over there. So there are some potential sites over there. There's, you know, some land behind Seton Coast side. There is this uh, California School Employees Association in Moss Beach property. That's about 11 acres. It doesn't have to all be housing, but I think it is zoned for low income housing. There's property, a post property on 92 on Half Moon Bay. Then we have some. We obviously have some county sites. I'd like to take a look at. So my recommendation is that we are getting some additional funding from RDA, the return of RDA money to this, to the county. And so I would recommended that we do take 20% because that, that was the old formula, 20% of those funds and set, set those aside mm -hmm. for housing. Uh, I do, I would like us to evaluate those p sites as potential housing sites. I just listed a few, I'm sure, you know, the, the, some, there's always controversy with uh, sites. There's also an unincorporated area be, on Belmont between you know, El Camino and, and 101. That's a potential site. So, mm -hmm. Evaluating those sites, 20% of the RGA money that's coming back to the county is set aside for potential housing. Um, and, and I do, I, Pastor Baines, I think, had hit it uh, right on the target that we have to work with the cities. Perhaps the county provides a degree of leadership. Cities, uh, you know, up and down the peninsula really have, I think, have, um, I think I really have stepped forward. I know the Supervisor Groove and I have worked on a, um, project on, on Maple Street that's actually it's actually a shelter but it's as it, you know it's doubles the capacity and, um, and I think it's really an excellent project that we're working with you know with the city of Redwood City um, and of course I do believe that we need to have data and um, you, you can't manage anything unless you have data somebody said that once and I think it's true you got to have data so I'm supportive of that additional funding for an extension of the clarity system. Those essentially be my recommendations. Just a couple of quick questions. I'm not sure if this is for Bill Lowell or for Ileana. Do we know which cities in the county have inclusionary housing? We do. 
I don't have it off the top of my head, but we have. Would you say half, three quarters? About half, and of course the inclusionary zoning ordinance were really crippled by the lawsuits uh, against them. I, There's I guess, still ways to. Yeah, I guess where I'm going with this, I mean, you know, we're seeing a fair amount of development in our county these days, and I wonder, you know, it's one thing to build on our land, the other is to incentivize some of the cities to do some inclusionary housing. So if they're going to build, you know, 400 units, if we partnered with them, could they make a, a certain portion of that inclusionary? Um, because, you know, I don't know that we as a county specific can build our way out of this, but I do think to incentivize, just like we do at MTC with these prior development areas, you incentivize people to do things around transportation, we could potentially do the same thing with some of the cities because, you know, when you start seeing that they're all market rate, you know, it's not helping anybody. You know, it's just it just keeps driving the prices up and up. Um, and I have one other question, too. It was sort of interesting to see that Daly City only has 2% of the homeless. Now, and that may be absolutely correct because we probably have, you know, the lowest ho house prices or home prices in, in the county mm -hmm. pretty much. But I was sort of curious, you know, we also have the lowest income per capita pretty close. So I, I, mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, those numbers seem a little skewed on the low side. I, uh, I'll let folks who work in homeless answer that one. But the first one also on the cities, uh, Supervisor Tissier, the um, – uh, 21 Elements Group has one of the, what's, uh, in addition to doing the housing elements now that are due next spring, and which is going very rapidly and well, um, they're also then turned around and did together, as each city wants, as more of a subscription, but most are in, uh, impact fee analyses. And this is the way a lot of jurisdictions are going uh, because of the problems with inclusionary zoning ordinances. Um, there can be a housing and a um, commercial impact fee uh, imposed that would that would be used, the proceeds of which would be used to uh, uh, pay for affordable housing development. So that's actually going on right now. And there are other things, and a lot of cities have done it. Um, there are density bonuses that can be given. There's zoning as of right. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the construction in Redwood City, uh, which is all market rate, but still came about as a result of the kind of work that they did as a specific area plan. And, uh, you know, when we look in many other uh, cities, we're seeing, for example, a development we're working on in Menlo Park, where, which had a density bonus. And so, as a result, they were able to add house, a more affordable housing to that site. So th there are a lot of things the cities can do, and the county. And I, I guess I would echo what Don said about the data. I mean, if we can look at you know the numbers here, if, and who's got inclusionary, who doesn't, and how we can incentivize that. And then also, the one thing that's been difficult, and I know it's going on in, in Daly City, is there's an opportunity to build a tremendous number of housing units on the Coma BART station area. The problem is, with cities that have so much, so many homes, more of a bedroom community, their concerns about the costs of the infrastructure. Yet here's an absolute opportunity that you don't want to lose. But how do we incentivize someone like that to be able to do it when their their budgets are in pretty dire straits right now? So it's, I'd like us to kind of explore those types of opportunities in some of the different cities um, where we can incentivize to, to increase the housing and also increase the BMR. Supervisor Tizier, in terms of the 2%, we'll go back and take a look at the numbers, but it was based on the last homeless census count, and we'll double check Daily City's numbers and get back to your office. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Graham? Um, I just wanted to, uh, to add a, a comment. <laughs> Wendy Goldberg, Center on Homelessness. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, the uh, Historically, the numbers in Daily City have been very low during the the homeless count, and from feedback from the partners uh, that we have in Daly City and the city um, government there, they believe that it's uh, got a very serious overcrowding problem, mm. but not a serious homeless on the street problem. Mm. So just wanted to add that. Supervisor Graham? Thank you. Um, I th I th you know, I'm going to say the obvious, but when we had redevelopment agencies, cities had a better ability to mm -hmm. build homeless shelters. They had a better ability to build permanent homeless housing. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I think we ought to do is convene a session with our legislative delegation and, and talk about just what Sacramento can do to help cities. 
I know there was a couple of things in the governor's budget, mm -hmm. but I think we should I think we should talk about doing more, and we should really be tough on it. And this again is where the cities and the counties can partner. Um, I think that's one thing I think we have to look at. And this this data, the statistics that we've gotten today, as well as this clarity data analysis, I think should give us some additional tools to do that. The other suggestion that I'd like to throw out is we have the Hope Task Force. And I wonder if we can expand that a little bit, add some more cities to it, add some more uh, providers to it, and maybe an economist or maybe some, some, some a data expert, and use HOPE as kind of the center for coordinating the things that we think we want to do. And I mean, today we have a wonderful turnout, and some of you are on HOPE, but maybe there's room for more of you, and, and we could make that kind of our working group to take to take this project on instead of reinvent, reinventing another um, kind of mm -hmm. climate to do that. We also have, uh, as, 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 as somebody alluded to, Ileana alluded to, we have the Community Action Committee, which is state funding, and we just got refunded for another year, and maybe we can use that as sort of a side vehicle to feed information to HOPE. Uh, but I just think we need to kind of focus where we are and put this someplace. And, and I think we have enough work plans, but to figure out what, what we can do. Um, and, and it would give us, I think, a, a place to go. And, that, and with more cities out there, we could talk about some of the density issues. I mean, I come from a city that passed a height and density uh, ordinance 15, 20 years ago. It's still in place, and, and um, it, worked for, it works for the city, but it, it is limiting. And so I think we have to kind of look at that, too, and we have to start talking about whether there should be areas of additional density. And Adrian's in a prime place to do that at MTC as you start funding the, uh, the, the, the PUDs. I mean, I think, so again, we have to, we kind of have to look at this regionally. We just, not even just this county, but we yeah, need to look yeah. at certain things regionally. Um, so those are some of the thoughts th that I had because um, it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just an economic issue and it's not just a housing issue. It really is a community issue and it really is a moral issue. We, we you know, we, we must solve this together. Thank you. It sort of feels like, Supervisor Horsley, with all due respects, that <clears throat> you've spent all the money over there on the coast for the for the homeless uh, building that you're going to do. I'll, I'll leave a little for you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions and then some comments, Ileana. On the chart, uh, Menlo Park isn't listed, and so I'm assuming they have no homeless in or Menlo Park? Less than 20. So Less they have than 158, it, according to it, could be grouped in other. Okay, so I see your note there. Thank you. And then uh, maybe on that chart that you're referring to, does it does it break out Redwood City and the unincorporated area uh, of Redwood City? Does, Selena, Wendy, does it break it out further? Um, we'll go to the actual data and break it out for you. If you, if you go to page seven of the of the of the Hope report, it, it does do that. I mean, it gives you the raw number. So you know, Redwood City has 645 sheltered, and unsheltered, and then unincorporated as a group. Uh, Supervisor Slocum, that's all unincorporated. It's 46. Does your packet have page numbers? It does, but page, well, it's 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 in this document that has the. the oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, couple of uh, observations and comments and you were asking for priorities and I, I think I, in my scribbled notes here, uh, I think I have around six or seven. So are you ready? <laughs> ready. All right. So uh, as you know, I'm a data person and so the whole clarity expansion and going back through that old system whose name I've forgotten to mine the data to show you know, to get at maybe what it might show us, I think is a priority. Um, I'm curious to know, but with that, how, how long does Kate Bristol or Wendy or you think we have um, to deal with this HUD shift? Is that something that has to happen like within 120 days or <laughs> a couple years or? We're what, talking the feds, right? right. <laughs> Nothing moves quickly. No. Uh, I think we've got some time. 
some time. Yes. Did Kate did Kate Bristol say yes? Okay. No. Okay. So data would be a priority with me. Um, the second thing is it seems like, and you've obviously done work on this, but as the feds change their policy, you talked about recalibrating or reworking the internal processes of the Center on Homelessness and HSA. And I don't know if you're, uh, you talked a little bit about some of that this morning, but applying lean process uh, improvement and how internally things are going to have to change is a priority, I think, um, because clearly the processes can't stay the same as they, as they were if we go to this rapid uh, rehousing uh, approach. Right. And I think that if we take an approach to look at the data, the data may inform us uh, in terms not only of population, but perhaps what the best approach may be. And, and as I mentioned, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Envision uh, statements about case management. Yeah. It's a critical component. So we don't certainly want to throw out what's working in San Mateo. And then I would compliment the folks from the center on this plan that was done uh, some years ago, I'm not sure, uh, March 2006 actually. And it was a 10 year plan to end homelessness. And I read through here and I thought the plan was awesome and congratulations to those of you that had a hand in this. But um, also just taking it another step further, I think it would be great if you know uh, we could see which things out of here were accomplished, which things are no longer appropriate as we make this shift, uh, what worked, what didn't work. Sort of just a, you know, I mean, the 10 years is up, I guess, next year. And clearly, we haven't ended homelessness, although we've made great strides. But just sort of a, a performance update on this um, plan, I think, would be helpful. Um, and that might get back to the, the data also. To uh, Pastor Baines and Supervisor Horsley and uh, other supervisors' comments, um, you know, perhaps we could take a look at um, some of this building that might go on on county-owned property. And Supervisor Horsley mentioned, I think, some parcels over on the coast, but there may be some parcels here. And at one time, I had a list of county-owned properties that I think uh, Raina uh, shared with me. And um, maybe there's some possibilities in, in that list of properties in District 4 and in District 3, um, you know, to, to look at county-owned own, owned land. Also think it's important to have one county point person on all this work as Pastor Bain said. This idea of working collaboratively with cities I think is the way to go. Uh, some time ago we took a tour of the facility in Palo Alto which was just awesome I thought and it was a collaboration and partnership between a lot of different people and I think but one of the secrets is having somebody in the county, whether it's the Center on Homelessness or you as director or somebody in the county manager's office, but some one person, to, as he said, to be point person on this effort. Um, so to be figured out later, I guess. Another thing that interests me, and I'm sorry for going on and on here, but the, the whole uh, population of those living in vehicles and uh, I see more and more RVs parked in Redwood City and in the unincorporated area and East Palo Alto as I travel around. And it's clear from the data that those numbers are increasing. Mm -hmm. And those people may be employed, they may be homeless veterans. I know that they were included in the, in the survey last time we did the survey. But I think mining this data for who those people are and what they're doing and what facilities exist for them Example, uh, with the folks down in, the, in Redwood City down here on uh, off Middlefield that park on the side streets, you know, where are those people showering? What, what are they doing for uh, sanitary needs that they have? And I know other areas I've read about have used the faith-based community to uh, park uh, RVs and cars in while they go in and shower and so on and so on. So maybe we could take a look at that whole growing segment of the population that are vehicularly uh, housed because I think that has grown significantly and I think we all see it as we drive around. Um, and maybe the last thing, I'm not sure here, let me just quick, 
quickly look at my notes, but would be uh, there are examples that we read about from Oakland and in other places. This example happens to be from Monterey uh, County, where they actually did a homeless forum. And what I thought was really cool about it was they put up black and white photos of some homeless people. And then at this event, those uh, homeless people actually got up and told their stories to this crowd. And I think it helps us you know, put a face on homelessness, the, the folks, to see this kind of thing. And I don't know what you meant by the connect, I think you called it connect events that yes. cities are doing. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see the Center on Homeless do, perhaps in collaboration, you know, things like this homeless forum that they, that they did in Monterey. And I can share this article with you so you can see. But that might include things like um, on the center's uh, website, you know, putting up stories of these folks. It might mean we saw an awesome video this morning from, uh, what was it, Pie, Pie Farms? Pie Ranch. Pie Ranch. And maybe a video, um, which I see at all the fundraising events I go to, the, din the dinners and whatnot, they show these videos of the clients and they have these really wonderful human interest stories. Maybe something like that is an idea to sort of start putting a face on this. And, and uh, uh, let's see, I think that gets us through six. <laughs> and uh, Seven. Just Seven. A, just a moment, I can't read my writing. Um, I'm just curious, this probably question isn't for you, but maybe uh, Peggy Jensen and maybe uh, Pastor Baines, but what is the status of, we had put aside some money for We Hope in East Palo Alto and there was some talk about expansion. Peggy can address it. Yeah, thank you. Through the President, Supervisor Slocum, um, Peggy Jensen, Deputy County Manager. Um, as directed by County Manager John Maltby, staff are doing their due diligence on the request for funding for We Hope. We are in the process of working on that, and as the County Manager said, we'll be reporting back to you in September. Thank you. I think that was it for me, Mr. President. You don't want to get to 10 comments? No, I, I think seven is fine. Okay. Thank you. Do you think three, though? That's okay. Three more, you can. Um, I'll, I'll share my uh, some thoughts and observations. You know, you know. First, it's it's great that every to see so many people here and so many people in this room are doing that, doing incredible work every day. Um, you know, I've had uh, a fair amount of exposure to the homeless issue now in South City and uh, uh, learned a lot about it and appreciate how challenging it is, but just uh, how compelling it is and how it's our you know, it's a problem we, we, we have to we have to solve. It's just not acceptable for people to be living outside. Uh, and some of the good news is is you know we should be proud. I I remember last winter, you know, just being really saddened by reading about people dying in the streets in Santa Clara on a cold night, and that didn't happen in San Mateo, and that's uh, because of really the great work that people in this room and others have have done. Um, and again, also on this good news uh, front, um, you know, one thing that uh, we did with the Measure A funds and uh, we've deployed in uh, South City, San Bruno, Brisbane is the, is the hut team model. And while I think it probably works best when you, in the, the classic hut, hut team, I think is combined with housing, like it was done with the Vendome. But in, in South City, we're just kind of just doing the hut team um, with that really focused approach. And it's, it's had incredible results and my hat's really off to, Envision Shelter Network and the young man who's out there on the street every day, you know, working these cases one by one. And in one particular case, uh, he saved the team saved an individual's life. So you know, but for that team, but for that funding, um, you know, it was re that was an incredible outcome. Um, there's been a lot of talk about supportive services, which um, uh, we all know is is, is critical to, for a substantial portion of the homeless whether that be case management um, and giving, giving people meaning, meaningful things to do during the day. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, housing and shelter is, is paramount, but you know, people have, have, have to have something productive to do or have a path, uh, a productive path that they are on during the day. Uh, a couple other uh, thoughts. You know, in reading the stories this weekend in the Chronicle, it was if I remember the numbers, it, it, was, it was stated that 19,000 people were moved off the street in San Francisco. But interestingly, 8,000 of those individuals were actually 
reconnected with family members or some other support network outside of San Francisco. So as we kind of rethink or revisit our plan, you know, I would I would suggest that you know we that that be part of our uh, approach too. If 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 there are if someone has a support network elsewhere, um, you know, they they would be that might be the right solution. You know, in terms of like specific next steps, uh, we've all spoken about the importance of data, and it'll probably take us a little while to get that data. But in the meanwhile, we do want to get this plan updated. I, I share uh, Supervisor Groom's point that it would seem that, that the, HOPE, the HOPE infrastructure would be well situated to work on that. And um, you know, maybe they could, you know, they got a, they, we have a plan, and now we, we need to kind of update it in light of what we've learned and in light of the new data that we do have. So, you know, hopefully, they could have that plan done by the end of the year. I mean. We, you know, we need to we need to kind of get all this good thinking in one document, and I do like the idea of of just kind of refreshing that that hope plan. And then, and finally, on funding, um, so there was you know, Ileana has pointed out that you know HUD is going to well, appears appears like they're going to really change the rules, and it, and it doesn't seem to me that we're going to be able to fit into these HUD rules very easily. You know, maybe for a small percentage of our total homeless population would be. Um, could benefit from a 30-day rapid rehousing program, but I don't. But it's been pointed out it's hard to do that without housing, and so you know I I don't think we should uh, do crazy things just to get HUD funding. I mean, if 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 we can't uh, if that's the only thing they're going to pay for, then I guess we just can't take their money because it's not it's not going to work that well in San Mateo County. So you know, local funding uh, is important, and uh, two things that were, were said today that. Uh, uh, I, I would ask, uh, you know, Rain and the county manager to work, maybe report back to us on is, you know, one is evaluating, putting that the the RDA funds that have that have come back to the county, and as we know, that's a complicated calculation because a lot of those funds aren't coming back now; they'll come back in future years after certain RDA debts are paid. So uh, I'm not exactly I don't, have, I don't have a good sense for how that flow of funds looks, but the idea of using 20 percent of that. To assist in this in this effort, I, you know, I, you know, I, I I'm supportive of, and I think I think I would ask the county manager just give us some sense for you know what what that looks like. What would that what would that look like over the next ten years? Um, and the second the second specific one that was mentioned, and this is more of a would take more of a collaborative effort, is you know impact fees, which of course needs to be done city by city. And I'm glad to see the county has done some of the is in the process of doing some of the initial work to. Uh, uh, was the nexus study that's required and that is being uh, being taken care of? Um, so uh, th those are some of, some of some of my inputs, and um, you know, it seems to me that it you know this is a time to refresh our efforts and re-energize our efforts, and um, you know, build on our successes and, and see if five years from now we don't have to wait for ten years that we, we we've seen some some more, some real real substantial progress. Yes, super busy. I'm just curious on this federal funding. Is it sort of all or none? I mean, in some respects, Shelter Network, especially the Daily City facility, has done what I would consider fairly rapid rehousing, considering the families that we're serving compared yeah. to w w when it started. But is this all or none with the feds? I mean, if we had a component of this that would re would be rapid rehousing, and then you have some transitional that you know just needs to be that way because we don't always have either the capability of getting people out that quickly or you know, we just don't have the, the housing, but does, is it all or none with the feds? I don't think they have it all thought out yet, oh, just no. quite yet. Okay. All of Okay. Can you, Kate? I think it's uh, every year something new happens, and so they have moved to my and have done this work for a very long time and worked with HUD for a very long time. The last two or three years, I would say they've moved surprisingly quickly to deliver the message that they're not interested in funding transitional housing as we currently understand it. And so I don't think that it means it's going to disappear tomorrow, but I do think um, it, it's a model that I think is 
um, it, it's going to be challenging to continue to use their funding to support transitional housing. Well, I get but that. I don't think it's going to go away overnight. Well, that, I, no, I guess that's where I was going. In other words, we are likely going to still need transitional housing in, in our county. Mm -hmm. But we also may be able to do some rapid rehousing. So mm -hmm. what I'm asking is, if we don't do all rapid rehousing and get rid of transitional, do we, do we not get any money if we don't do it all or nothing? No, I wouldn't say that. So I would say it would be difficult to continue to use their funds to do like the transitional. That. They want to shift it. But, but you could certainly find other sources to well, continue doing I it. I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, obviously we've talked about a lot of different strategies, collaborating with cities and trying to see whether there's some funding matches we can do there. It'd also be helpful maybe if we're going to look at this, to have this task force, look at, you know, where are those areas that we really think we could do rapid rehousing? I mean, there's there's a role there for sure. And I know Shelter Network has tried to do more and more of that, but again, you have a housing issue uh, cost-wise, but I do think we have an opportunity to do that. And one of their successes, if I recall correctly, is they built a rapport with apartment owners and have made it a little bit easier to, to put people from the family crossroads shelter into permanent housing, but that they've spent a lot of time doing that and w building up that rapport. So I do think there's opportunities for that. So I wouldn't want to lose federal funding if we could use it for that sure. and transitional housing, because I think the supportive part is, is critical. I mean, you, you just can't throw people in housing and hope things go away. Right. They need exactly. some assistance. Otherwise, they may not have been there to begin with. If, right. not, not all, some are by happenstance, but there are some issues there as well. So anyway, I'd like us to look at that, you know, if the feds do this, where can we take that niche and that money and put it towards that and continue with our transitional as well? Yeah, I, I definitely support that. In, in <laughs> there, there will be a, we'll, we'll be able to make it work in some instances for sure. Any further uh, comments? Uh, just uh, one quick comment. Is that it, it, this doesn't necessarily require building. It could be, you know, remodeling uh, <coughs> existing housing too. So, uh, so it's, it, and I think as Adrian uh, said, it's, it, that's that's uh, distinctly a possibility as well. But I'd like to thank you and your staff and Sarah Rosendahl from my staff that worked uh, with yours uh, putting the presentation together. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I have a comment here from Pastor Baines on uh, – October 30th, uh, they'll be hosting uh, We Hope Homeless Connect in East Palo Alto. Okay. Mr. President, if I, if I could just recap uh, as far as actions. So there were two urgent items that I heard. One was on the doing the data analysis and the clarity system. So we need to bring back something to your board pretty quickly on that, maybe at the next meeting, the next couple of meetings. And then... Um, probably in the September timeframe, the RDA analysis, and then beginning to work on how to get the cities involved in the task force, the HOPE task force, and December for the HOPE, the actual update and maybe a redesign plan for the federal shift and bringing that back to the board at, by the end of the calendar year. Is that a good timeline? I'd like to just ask one more thing. It doesn't have to be something that has to come back to the board, but if we can get the listing of all the cities that do have inclusionary housing or okay. vice versa, the ones that don't. Okay. There is one other thing I, I would like us to do, uh, do some analysis of some of the sites, potential sites, county sites, as well as some of the sites that uh, I'll be glad to send you my yeah. list. And, and we had that I, I have list as well. Okay. And, and just uh, for a point of clarity, so I, I, there, there's no new task force, right? We're going to have a, the focus, no. the work will be done, the redesign of the plan will be done through um, hope. through HOPE. Right. Come and, I, and I think we ought to look at expanding HOPE to, to make sure we, we, we have the extra people that we need and uh, more city people. Yeah, I, I think the end of the year is fine, but I think maybe Ileana wants to weigh in on that. I don't, I don't yeah, know. I don't know if that, how that works. But, but then the other part of this is, are we really talking about this work being done by the HOPE Committee or some Warren, other task force? Warren, or, what I was suggesting is yeah. that since we have HOPE in place and hope, HOPE's charge is to mm -hmm. HOPE, you know, and, and homelessness in San Mateo County, there are some of their very key people that have housing organizations and have housing money on that plus we have city people so we got the county and the city talking to each other and I think we sh we could expand the membership 
um, to to include some data people, some economic, some 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 people with economic with economics, and see who's missing. Take a look at the makeup of it and see who's missing, and just expand it. Uh, that group has done a lot of work mm -hmm. for a number of years, and I think that to to sort of reinvent the wheel would mm -hmm. would be foolish. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask one more request? Um, on the rapid rehousing, uh, you know, it's it's sort of in flux, so to speak, at the moment. We don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow, if it's going to happen three years from now, you know, all that. I wonder if we can just be kept updated. It could just be through a member's memo or something like that, something to let us know, um, you know, what the status is. And the other thing, you know, if we need to, we should be calling on our legislators to give some feedback to what the feds are attempting to do and just make sure that we can use, it's not an all or none proposition. Absolutely, we'll keep the board updated on any changes or updates. And I had a question about HOPE, not, um, not, not having that much familiarity with HOPE. How, how do we, how is that actually staffed? I mean, uh, is it, I assume it's our county staff that it's supports Wendy. it. Wendy is the chief, the, the lead staff person. Okay. I, I just have one, I, I just, I just have one more, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, again, so, to, many of our departments, uh, like the Sheriff's Department, uh, Health Department, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you must, I guess the HS, HSA, we have foster kids who are released into homelessness, and I, I, I'd like our departments to work on making sure that we, uh, let's work on that so that we're not releasing our mm -hmm. clients into homelessness, as, as that's also something our departments need to work together on. Yeah, that'd be a good element for the new plan. You know, yeah. really emphasize that. In terms of time frame, I would just uh, comment the HOPE plan. What uh, maybe the end of year is aggressive, Ms. Ferales, and once we get the data, uh, we'll have to get an RFP or something to get the data analyzed. Then we can convene the group uh, to develop the plan. Does that sound reasonable? Good. Thanks. Excellent. All right, any uh, final comments? Seeing none, we'll uh, adjourn. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today and sharing your thoughts. <laughs>